Lucas. We are going to call the Novi Board of Education regular meeting to order. It is February 4th, 2021. And I want to welcome everybody who is here virtually and also watching from afar. Um, if we can get a roll call vote, Mr. Mena, that would be fabulous. Trustee Cook. Here. Trustee Hood. Here. Trustee Mena. Here. Trustee Murphy. Here. Trustee Roney. Here. Trustee Ruskin. Here. And Trustee Smith. Here. Okay, if we can rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. If I can get an approval of the agenda, please. I'll move to approve the agenda as presented. I'll second. Recommended by Mr. Cook and seconded by, supported by Mrs. Roney. We can get a roll call vote, Mr. Minow. Trustee Cook? Yes. Trustee Hood? Yes. Trustee Mena? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Roney? Yes. Trustee Ruskin? Yes. And Trustee Smith? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Next on our agenda is comments from the audience related to agenda items. As you know, we're still virtual, so we have a Google form that is posted uh, right before the meeting that public comment can be um, put through. We have a two minute time limit um, for this evening. Mr. Mena, I'm gonna ask you if you would be willing to do the timer. And as Dr. Matthews will be looking at his screen, if you could just kind of give a shout out for time, we would appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Thank you, Dr. Ruskin. Uh, tonight we have uh, currently uh, 34 comments, and so I will proceed. Uh, first comment is from uh, Chris Holman. Uh, to the elected representatives of the board, if you aren't voting tonight for a de definitive start date for four to five days of in-person instruction for all students, who are you representing? You are the only voice our students have. You don't represent the teachers union and you aren't supposed to be a rubber stamp for the administrator administration's proposals. 13 other nearby districts have shown it can be done and done safely. Brighton has done it with 85% of their students in person four days per week since September. South Lyon voted on Tuesday to return all hybrid students four days per week by March 1st after starting the year all virtual. The current hybrid model is broken. A teacher logging on to a Zoom for five minutes to say, here's your assignment and then logging off to get back to their coffee is not teaching. We've asked for improvement since October and absolutely nothing has been changed. Please do your duty and represent our students who have no voice for over a year. Vote to return all hybrid students to full-time in-person instruction by March 1st. For all they have endured, our students have been the true heroes for the past year. Vote to give them the education they deserve. Comment two is from uh, Kelly uh, Kakish. Thank you so much for all your hard work during these trying times. Thank you for following the science and making sure our kids and teachers go back to school safely. Comment three from Ricardo Lopes. I have two boys who attend third and fourth grade in Novi. Initially, we signed up our children for hybrid due to the safety guidelines being followed of masking up and social distancing. As a result, both of our boys are thriving socially and academically due to the consistency and routine, as well as small class size that NCSD has set in place. I'm concerned about them returning five days. A, they can no longer socially distance. B, interruption to routine if the class has to quarantine. Having spoken to friends and family in other districts, their schedules and children are a mess due to the constant hiccups in routine and schedule because of positive COVID cases. I urge you to consider leaving the hybrid schedule as is to maintain some sort of normalcy in our children's lives. Comment four, Ashley Burry. Dear Board of Education, I write tonight to voice my strong objection to the proposal to bring back all K-6 hybrid students to full-time in-person instruction on February 17th. Over the course of this year, I've been asked numerous times how it's being, 
how it's been being a hybrid teacher. I responded in the same manner every time. It's the most difficult year I've had as a teacher, but we're safe, the kids are learning, and Novi is doing it right. Up until recently, I have believed those words. I trusted that our board and our administration were going to make decisions that would keep our community safe. I've been a personal ambassador and advocate for Novi Schools as I truly believe the district was putting safety first, doing their very best to maintain high academic standards while surviving a pandemic, a delicate and courageous balancing act at best. All staff and administration have invested enormous effort and dedication to make the system we are currently have, that we currently have successful. We have done our very best and it's working. Tonight I write not only for myself, but for all the voices you need to hear before you make your decision. This letter is for them. This is for the entire Novi, Novi community, everyone who you represent, all of whom are potentially impacted by the decisions you make here tonight. Not just a select group of loud voices pressuring us to all return before it is safe. This is for the majority of parents who may be frustrated, but know that Novi is doing the right thing. Our district's points of pride have always been what sets us apart from others. We use the hashtags Novi Pride and we are Novi, not because we want to compare ourselves to others, but because we demand the very best of ourselves individually and collectively. Moreover, we as educators actively instill a sense of community in our students, a community that is not just within the confines of our brick walls, but extends beyond and into the greater Novi community. We care about each other. We are in this together. That's what makes us different. Rather than looking to other districts, we should look to our own success. Novi has offered an in-person option all year without having to shut down. Other districts have not. We have been careful and have made our decisions based on data. Why should we change it? This is for the doctors, nurses, epidemiologists. Hi, Dr. Matthews. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Mena. Uh, comment five. Uh, Hemant Sadar. The comment suggestion is with reference to Dr. Matthews' January 27th email explaining the status of where NCSD is headed and the three metrics for resuming five-day in-person classes. The three metrics Dr. Matthews list are extern ex externalities largely outside the control of NCSD and puts the district at the mercy of external events. Indeed, Dr. Matthews' previous communication to parents have highlighted the point that, for the most part, NCS students who tested positive for COVID-19 appear to have been exposed outside of the school environment, socializing, sports, et cetera. It would therefore seem far better to devise a metric that NCSD can affect via direct actions. For example, a metric that considers the number of infections or cases that are directly attributable to NCSD school activities, clubs, sports, et cetera, or traceable to exposure at NCSD schools would be more useful in evaluating whether or not NCSD needs to deploy more stringent restrictions or other corrective actions. One would think something along these lines would be one of the most heavily weighted factors for determining whether it is safe to open five-day in-person instruction. Comment six, Allison Gray. I'm a teacher in the district and also a parent of a first grader in Novi. Both teachers and parents want the same things. We want our children and students to enjoy school, learn every day, and more importantly, stay safe. To do all this, educators needed the support of their students' families and greater community before COVID, and we need it now more than ever. The comments I hear pit many parents against teachers and administrators. It is not us versus them. We need to work together to keep school a safe place for all kids and adults who help them learn. COVID might not affect my daughter or her classmates, but her teacher has no protection. First graders do not adhere to CDC guidelines. The adults involved, parents and teachers, need to ensure that social distancing and mask wearing is happening. We have been doing that since the beginning of the year. It is extremely difficult to do that when 30 kids are in one class at a time. If we care about the well-being and safety of our children and students, we have to care about the well-being and safety of our teachers and administrators. There's not one without the other. Comment seven, <clears throat> Jason Manza. Members of the board, I would first like to thank Dr. Matthews for the comprehensive report he prepared which set out the current Novi district COVID response, as well as comparing it to neighbor, neighboring districts. I would like to highlight how Nova has been performing dramatically better than most of the surrounding districts. This is not by chance, but due to the diligent enforcement of restrictions put in place. I understand that everyone wants to go back to normal, but we can't. We do not live in normal times and simply acting like things are normal because it is easier is exacerbating problems. We need to talk to our children, explain that these are unprecedented times and that they are being forced to make a sacrifice and that it's not fair. What we shouldn't do is put everyone at risk because it's easier to just act normal. This past weekend on a, an assisted living and surgical rehab facility in Howe, 
which has 70 beds, experienced an outbreak of COVID-19. Over the past year, they have ha had only five cases in the facility, including staff. This past weekend and into this week, they had over 50 staff and residents test positive, have reported six deaths and more than a dozen critical hospitalizations. This is a result of trying to rush to normalcy. This outbreak is not over because a few people have been vaccinated. We will be back to normal, but we aren't yet. Please listen to the staff and teachers who comment repeatedly saying that we want all children back in the classroom when it is safe, but they don't feel it is safe yet. Comment eight <clears throat> from Carrie Uchuk. Dear Board of Education, hybrid teaching has been one of the most difficult challenges I ever faced as a sixth grade teacher of 25 years in Nova. I have dreams of returning to a full class of students, working in partners, sharing materials, and participating in small group projects. I want to be able to sit next to a student, help revise a paper, or just talk about the book they're reading. What a day it will be when I can just see their smiling faces without a mask. The struggles, incredible workload, and technology prep needed to prepare to teach in this new way is worth is worth enduring in order to have the ability to keep kids safe, to keep staff safe, and to, or to, to keep staff safe and to keep teachers safe. However, I've read in community posts where parents want their kids back to school full time and that adults safety should not be a consideration by the board. That hit hard. I do not feel safe from COVID without social distancing in my classroom and building. I am not vaccinated yet and, and not for lack of trying. There just aren't enough vaccinations yet. Board members years ago, Three of you entrusted me to educate your children, but more importantly, to keep them safe, safe from others, safe from active shooters, safe from deadly allergies, safe from injury. Now my own three children who rely solely on me for their well-being are asking you in return to protect their mother. Please give staff and teachers time and the opportunity to get vaccinated before bringing students back full-time to school without social distancing. Comment nine, <clears throat> Sharon Trump. To the Board of Education, administrator, Administration, Educators, and Staff, thank you for the hard work you have done and continue to do for my kids and all Novi kids during this stressful time. Like so many parents, I am concerned about my children's education and their mental health, both of which have been negatively impacted by the pandemic. This past 11 months has been full of loss, hardship, and new challenges, but I am grateful that each of you has risen to that challenge and worked to provide families and staff with options for virtual or hybrid learning. I very much look forward to the day that my hybrid learners can return to five-day in-person learning. I support Dr. Matthews' proposal that the decision be guided by metrics, not simply a set date on a calendar. We have come so far. I hope that with increased vaccine access, we might begin to see the numbers move down. Until numbers are lower, however, I ask that social distancing be maintained in the classrooms to protect not only our students, but their educators and the larger community. Thank you. Comment 10. Debbie Luke, a letter to the Board of Education. It is time for our children to be back in school. I write this note to you not as a parent who treats school like a time clock where I simply drop my child off each day and pick them up at the end. I'm an active member in our school community, the PTO president at our elementary school, and I've spent many hours inside the school building over the last four years. I spent time reading alongside students for extra support, hosting board meetings, volunteering in the library, roller skating in the gym, giving money for holiday parties, making collages. The list goes on. I will continue to be heavily involved and supportive as my children move through Novi schools and I am grateful for our district. I will express that I've been proud of how Novi navigated through this, especially in the beginning by offering in-person learning experience for our students. Though the hybrid method is not perfect model, it has offered our students the ability to be in person for a portion of their learning. I think in part <clears throat> of this, many of us as parents have pretended like this is working because we have been thankful for the opportunity to have any in-person learning for our children. It is time though for us to stop pretending that this is working. For the majority of us, it is not. Our children have sat on the sidelines since last March and navigated through this mess better than most adults. They have had to completely change their routines, schedules and adapt to new school models and ways of learning. They have persevered as much as possible, even though at times their best interests were not considered. I have two children in this district and my husband and I both work full time. My husband is a firefighter here in Novi, so I understand the complexity of what I am asking when I am begging for our teachers to get back in the building with our kids five days a week. My husband has not missed a shift since this started. Last March, I was there with everyone else wiping down groceries, making him change his clothes and shower as soon as his shift was finished and asking him every day to mask up and be safe. Since last year, we have learned so much more about COVID-19. We have learned which activities present levels of high risk and which do not. The CDC and the WHO have both acknowledged that schools are very low risk in the spreading of COVID-19 
yet our children remain at home. I'm aware that some of our teachers have had COVID-19, but they are not getting it from our students. Hi, Dr. Matthews. Month. Thank you. Comment 11 from uh, Jennifer Lozell. We students and parents have completed, have complied with all of your directives and done all that you have asked. Now it is the board's turn to do what we ask and return our kids to in-person school five days a week. Our kids' education demands it for their continued education. Our students' educated, education is suffering via the hybrid model by lack of learn, time learning in school and the school board and the Novi ISD need to be held responsible and do what is right for our children and uphold the goals, beliefs, and motto of the Novi School District and support the education of our, of, of our schools. Please do not let the arbitrary metrics, ones that are not supported by any local, state, and or federal government scientific boards or health and human services, hold us back any longer and look at the information coming to us from other school districts that, that can make full-time school work, we can too. Comment 12, Krista Chernowski. I am writing to request that you insist that our NCSD administration provide a clear path, a clear plan with a path that leads to four plus days of in-person in learning for all hybrid students, including grades seven to 12 by March 1st. The real experience of this district and others in our nearer geography is better measure of what it is safe than the arbitrary numbers being used. Schools can be done safely, and I would think that the 712 age group even more so as they have now been conditioned to wear masks and social distance. School has not been proven in any district to be a common source of community spread. The high school students need to be in school to assure that they can be prepared to perform well at the college level. These kids deserve to be as prepared as any classes previously graduating from Novi High School. Please work together to put a plan together to return to four plus days of in-person learning, including 712 by uh, March 1st. <clears throat> Comment 13. Mike Lubin. Good evening. Tonight's recommendation is disappointing. The four alternatives are still centered on meeting metrics that we are already very close to. It is my thought and seemingly the thought of other districts that these are guidelines. The improved mental health trade-off is worth the minimal relative risk we take by not exactly hitting these metrics. I admittedly have not looked at other districts numbers, but my guess is that very few are strictly adhering to them. Certainly not the Oakland County Schools as, as all of the recommendations include metrics for all of Oakland County. Why is NOVA? Some of these schools have been in person all year. The recommendation cites only situations for schools in Oakland County. Several schools in Wayne and Livingston are in full time. Is it perfect? No, it will never be perfect. It also cites only whether the other districts are currently doing, not the future plans. For example, South Lyons plan also includes the following. Beginning on March 1st, all high school students will attend the four in-person instruction days unless they are quarantined or otherwise ill. That is left out of the superintendent's report. The administration continues to believe that hybrid is working. It is not. Dr. Matthews is able to watch only the teacher's perspective. Come to my house and watch from my kid's point of view. It's not working nor meaningful. The teachers are struggling with it, at times practically begging kids to turn on their cameras. Finals have been canceled. Credit, no credit is an option. Cheating is allegedly rampant and Michigan head of education is calling for extra school days. Morale is low. I don't wish to point fingers, but at this point it is clear that the school board is ultimately responsible for this. The administration plan, the administration needs to be told that the community expects kids to be in school full time and demand a plan be drawn up to do that. On March 1st, let's make sure the number one school district in the state isn't one of the only ones without full-time in-person learning. We represent our students and vote for a full-time return to school no later than March 1st. Comment 14, <clears throat> Leanne Molnar. What will school look like if we all go, if we go all in five days a week as far as lunch and specials go for elementary students? Also, is five days a week the only option? Four days of in-person learning combined with keeping virtual Wednesdays sounds like a nice option as it is the only opportunity kids and I get to see each other unmasked. Virtual Wednesdays creates a different kind of connection, even if it is through a computer screen. Thank you for your time and consideration. Comment 15, Betsy uh, Bodine. Good evening, and thank you for all your time and effort on keeping our children safe and educated. I understand that a lot of people want to go back to school full time, and believe me when I say it is all is what we all want. The CDC does say that we need not wait for vaccines in order to reopen safely. So some people are asking, why not reopen? The CDC says transmission in schools is very low when we are using masks, disinfecting, and social distancing in the classrooms. 
We cannot maintain social distancing with full classes of kids in many of our classrooms. It is not within CDC guidelines to reopen without distancing. Until the numbers of infection are reduced and our teachers have had the opportunity to be vaccinated in lieu of social distancing, we cannot pretend that reopening would be safe. Additionally, there are several new mutations that have arrived in the US and are expected to become dominant strains soon. Increased community spread means increased opportunity for the virus to mutate outside the range of vaccine. Returning to school is an unsafe, in an unsafe way will not help in the long run as we may end up needing to wait on the development of new vaccines. I've also seen suggestions that we should just select a reopen date regardless of COVID data. We must not allow our desire for normalcy to make the decision. This year has been hard for all of us for different reasons. I know our family has struggled more this year than most. However, that does not mean that reopening full-time is the solution to these issues. These are not normal times and we must continue to operate with the long-term goals in mind. Thank you for keeping our children and community safe. Comment 16, Tracy Rich Creek. Hello, we chose hybrid for our sophomore because we want her to be her to physically be in school as much as possible and to have the socialization and in-person experiences that students should be having. We already watched our other daughter miss out on her senior year last year and all those special moments that, can that she can never get back. Please do what you can to get the students back to school four or five days a week so they can get the education they deserve and salvage what is left of the school year. In addition, I want you to, to seriously look at the hybrid model. You had promised us on numerous occasions that the administration was going to make it better. Do you realize that my daughter doesn't get out of bed until 11 on Mondays and Thursdays, and then she typically spends one to two hours on schoolwork and is done for the day? My expectation for a hybrid student on their virtual day should be about five to six hours of schoolwork, just like if they were at school. For the entire school year, she has had minimal schooling on Mondays and Thursdays and only half days on Wednesdays. She has lost a significant amount of education that she would have received being in school five days a week. I am pleading with you to look at the curriculum and make sure every teacher is being consistent with how they are teaching. In my opinion, putting an assignment in a folder that takes a student less than 15 minutes to complete is not good enough. Why can't every teacher record themselves in 30 minute lecture that they can post online and give 10 to 15 minute homework assignments like they would be doing in a classroom? Why should one student be penalized because their teacher isn't technolog technologically savvy and only gives 10 minutes of assignments in a folder? while another teacher teaching the same subject might be recording a lecture and giving homework and assignments. Or, as many of us have asked since March of last year, why can't all teachers teach the same lesson to students sitting in their classroom at the same time as those virtually online? This is currently happening in some classrooms right now, so I'm not sure why it can't be done for the majority. In summary, I am 100% for getting our kids back in school four to five days a week based on the science and statistics. Also, please don't assume that hybrid is working just because parents have chosen it for the school year or because they haven't written a letter like this one. We are exhausted and disappointed in the Bye. two and a half. Thank you. <clears throat> Comment 17. Mike uh, Garbasic. Good evening, Novi School Board of Education. I'm running to express our family's support of immediately returning to five-day in-person instruction. The CDC, the American Academy of Pediatricians, and Governor Whitmer's own Michi Michigan Safe Schools plan all support going back to school full time following the safety protocols. We have sat on the sidelines and watched as Brighton School District successfully started this year with four full days of instruction per week, and they've safely maintained it. We should be following their example and returning our students to full instruction for their educational, physical, and mental well being. I believe Brighton's example is more relative to our school district than using Oakland County case counts. Our students shouldn't be punished based on data coming from as far away as Holly, Oxford, or Pontiac. In March, we are coming up on one whole year's worth of education lost, and that's completely unacceptable. I strongly encourage our district to bring our hybrid K-6 students back immediately to full-time and phase in older grades as soon as possible. Thank you. Comment 18. Kelly Janik. The question that needs to be answered tonight by our elected school board members is what date are the hybrid kids returning to full time in person? I'm writing in hopes for you to hear from a parent with two kids in K-4 at Village Oaks and as a working registered nurse at a local hospital. We chose from the beginning to have our kids go in person in hopes of getting to full five day in person instruction. Kids need social interaction and teacher instruction five days a week. This has put a strain on the parent-child relationship as well as kids not getting instruction five days a week from, teach, from a teaching professional. We have a child in kindergarten and a child in second grade and they are both struggling for different reasons. Novi 
always seems to be big on kids' mental health while they are failing our kids. Are, these are such formative years in school. COVID and any variants are not magically going away anytime soon. The metrics that keep being pushed by the superintendent is not applied by any health agency. Why are we following some made up metrics? Science shows us that it is not being spread in the classrooms. We want our kids that are in the number one school district in Michigan to be in school full time. Now, now, they're in some, now there is some PR that I would appreciate. We aren't asking for families who choose virtual to come back full time. I'm asking leadership to step up and actually lead. If other districts can find a way to get kids back full time, why can't we? It is the elected school board members job to vote for what the parents are begging for. Why aren't you challenging administration to do better? If we continue just keeping with the same, we're simply kicking the can down the road. What happens this fall when COVID is still here? More of the same, the kids are suffering. Please listen to the parents and vote to get these kids back in person five days a week as soon as possible. Comment 19, <clears throat> Catherine McGuire. Thank you very much for your thoughtful discussion and consideration of the return to five day a week plan. The situation is almost impossible to resolve. It is true that a return to in-person learning five days a week would be ideal. It is also true that we can only do so when it is safe and right now it is not safe as there is still community spread in our area. One important factor that has kept us safe thus far is social distancing in the classroom. If that cannot be maintained, then we should not return. And basic math suggests it may be difficult, if not impossible, to get more than 14 kids in a 700 square foot room and allow for six feet of social distancing. Check out the socially distanced classroom layout and capacity calculators on the web and you will see what I mean. You would be equally hard pressed to get more than 20 students in the same size room with just three or four feet of distance. Yet for middle school and high school, it is very likely combining the A and B hybrid sections together will yield more than 20 kids in a class in a room. With this in mind, I highly recommend that the board continue putting their trust in science, math, and the administration and endorse Dr. Matthews' plan to return to five days a week instruction when it is safe to do so. Comment 20. Emily Samuels. I'm a longtime art teacher from Orchard Hills Elementary. I'm writing tonight in regards to the idea of sending hybrid students back five days a week very soon. As a specials teacher for kindergarten through fourth grade, I see multiple classes weekly. I would like to thank the powers that be for making the decisions they have so far this year. I hope that the same course of action will continue until numbers change and we are in a much better situation with COVID-19. Specials have been, have been doing nine week blocks for kindergarten through fourth grade this year. We are seeing one fourth the number of students at a time that we usually do so groups can remain small and there is less total students traveling through the specials rooms at, than in the past. I believe this was the right choice for our district. We've seen smaller groups than usual on multiple days of the week. Thank you so much for making safety a top concern. The plan was realistic and doable. We need it to continue. I trust the decisions that our teacher and administrative leaders made for us special teachers and students in elementary grade so far. Let's continue to make smart choices and trust in the leadership of those that made our scheduling decisions in the first place. Comment 21. <clears throat> Kristen Hoy, good evening, NCSD Board of Education and Administration. I have two hybrid A students at the high school. Please keep the high school hybrid students at two days per week in-person instruction and do not attempt to add in-person days. I sincerely appreciate all the metrics Dr. Matthews provided in tonight's board packet. The most eye-opening information to me was a chart comparing NCSD and the four neighboring districts. Novi had four cases and quarantined four individuals. The other districts had similar number of cases, but quarantined five, eight, and 20 times the number of individuals. How can a district provide quality instruction when there's such a huge domino effect due to contact tracing? This chart supports that we are doing, what we're doing is working. My children have some large hybrid classes of 20 plus students. These classes were moved to a double classroom so that six feet of social distancing is still maintained. If hybrid A plus B are combined, there would be 40 students in one in-person class, which is completely unacceptable, even in non-COVID time. Please leave high school hybrid students to two days per week for in-person instruction. Also during his comments, would Dr. Matthews please provide an update on how we're doing with vaccinations for staff, both the first shot and the second shot. Thank you for all that you do. Comment 22, Jenny Lubin. I am making a plea to the board to return all of our hybrid students to school full time. The overall well being of these kids has to be the forefront now. The kids that you represent need it, deserve it, and want it. 
when the choice for hybrid was made, it was made with the intention that full-time would return as soon as possible. Other districts around us are doing it for their high school kids. Why are our metrics different? Novi Board of Education, please represent our students and vote for a full-time return to school. Comment 23, Dwayne and Jennifer Damore. We have three Novi School District children enrolled in the hybrid model in middle school, Meadows, and elementary school. We believe in-person school is the best methodology for educating our kids, but are disappointed and frustrated with the hybrid model. We have seen no improvement in the asynchronous days, even though significant concerns were raised months ago. Kids need quality interactive instruction for five days per week. In-person learning, especially when half of the district students are virtual, can be done safely. Our kids' return to school should not be dictated by COVID infection rate metrics that are not based on scientific research and not linked to actual impacts in an in-person education modality. Please vote to return all hybrid students to full-time in-person instruction as soon as possible. Comment 24, Hartmus Allison, or Allison Hartmus. I'm a first grade hybrid teacher at Parkview Elementary. I'm writing the, uh, a comment to the board to encourage them to hold off on sending K-6 students back to full class sizes right now. The hybrid model that we have right now is working. Students are learning, relationships are strong, safety is a priority. Bringing all students back together right now would make teaching easier, sure, but it would also be a lot more stress and worry about my health and safety. I'm not okay with that. I should not have to work in an environment that I feel unsafe in. I am not fully vaccinated yet and will not be by February 17th. Teachers need a little more time to get their vaccines before we should be considering bringing everyone back at once. With all due respect, board members and parents are not in our classrooms every day. They don't feel the fear that we do when we are thinking about returning to full class sizes too soon. Please give us a little more time to secure our safety and vaccines and feel safe coming to school every day. Please listen carefully to teachers' concerns because we, as a district, could not truthfully say that we put students first if we choose to put teachers last. Comment 25, Tim Lesowski. <clears throat> I really hope the entire board realizes the damage to our 712 students that have been inflicted by inaction. The hybrid model is broken. The board has done very little to make any changes or force the superintendent to make changes. The superintendent and others on his staff keep talking about how great the hybrid model is. They cannot possibly be speaking of the high school experience. They talk about the changes that have been made. What are they? I have three at Novi High School and have seen virtually zero changes since the first meeting the superintendent admitted, admitted changes were necessary back in November. It is all lip service and zero action. South Lyon just became yet another district to vote in-person school at four days per week for high school. All we hear are excuses, never any solutions or ways to be creative and come up with solutions. I am tired of nonstop excuses and empty promises. At what point will the supposed best school district in Michigan actually, actually act like it? The best school district would lead, pave the way for others to follow. We are stuck in reverse while, while we watch everyone else lead. Our children are suffering. Step up, do something, take action, do what you were voted to do. Get our 712 students in school at least four days per week by March 1st. Comment 26, Todd Lozell. Enough is enough. Why are members of this community forcing me, you, and others to choose between the health of our children and the health of our teachers? Ultimately, it comes down to a knowledge gap, unabridged ignorance. It has been proven that these imperatives can be accomplished in parallel. The board's current metrics are outdated, unproven, and yield no value. It's been shown locally, nationally, and across the world that we can do this. Look around you. Look at your neighbors. Look at the CDC. Look at science. All, all say we can do this. This isn't a mutually exclusive decision, yet members of our community want us to think otherwise. Our understanding of this pandemic has changed dramatically since it began. We need to use that knowledge to protect the ones we love. We are the leaders in the community, and we need to lead accordingly. Open the schools. Let our children return full-time. Let parents return to their careers. Let children be children. Let teachers teach. Let's protect everyone. All of this can be done with the right leadership. Follow your instinct. Follow the science. Follow your heart. This is your time to shine. You took these positions because you care. Well, now is your time to make a difference. Everyone is looking to you for guidance. Guide them, let them work together to protect everyone, our kids and our teachers. Failure of either option is a failure of both. Our kids are losing, our teachers are losing. You're the only vote that matters now. My children's health, our teacher's health, our health is in your hands. It's time to shine, shine, shine. Listen to your heart, shine. Let's get our kids back in school and let's protect our teachers. We can and must do both. 
Comment 27. <clears throat> Lydia Kopecki. All science and studies are pointing to the importance of children returning full time in classroom. Please adhere to the science. These recommendations come from the CDC and the NIH, the National Institute of Health. Please represent our students who have had no voice for over a year. Vote to return all hybrid students to full-time in-person instruction by March 1st. Comment 28, Kristen Forsyth. Dr. Matthews and school board members, thank you for all your time and energy spent trying to create successful learning environments for our children. I have three kids participating in the hybrid model, all in different schools. I watched them struggle with learning on the off days. I watched them try to remain positive despite despite feeling isolated from their community of teachers and classmates. I watched them get on the bus with huge smiles and grateful hearts because it was finally an in-person day. These kids know what it is, what a gift it is to be part of the Novi schools. That is why I don't expect the administration to just do what other schools are doing and follow suit. I do, however, expect the leaders of this community to look to other schools that are having successful in-person experiences and figure out how we can do the same. How can we give our children more? 29. Michelle King, I will keep it plain and simple. Get our children back in school, enough is enough. Not one thing has been done to improve hybrid in a year and it is not acceptable. Put all grades back in school where they need to be by March 1st. Comment 30, Chris Indrizi <clears throat> to the school board and uh, Dr. Steve Matthews. I've read through everything and rather than trying to convince you how I believe that school should be opening five days a week, especially for elementary children, I'd like to address the topic another way. We understand and fully appreciate all of our students and faculty members that are devoted to the virtual model. This suits them very well and I wish them much success. However, with that being said, I would like to implore you to send out a survey to all the hybrid parents to see how this is working out for them. <clears throat> Leave sections for comments as well. Absolutely nothing has changed for us in the hybrid model since the first live meeting when a select few people spoke of what our children are doing on the days when they are not in school. I've been sitting in on the Zoom lessons randomly and in one of my daughter's classes where the teacher spent approximately 25 minutes into the lesson trying to figure out who the hacker was and had the students check their Twitter accounts to see if they could help. So she kept logging everyone out, giving them new passwords, only to repeat this over and over again. At the end, she said, well, you guys have the study package, just complete those. In addition, some teachers in their Zoom teachings early as well. These are just a few examples. Many of us parents are sharing the same stories on and on our off days, there is no reason to get up and get ready to do homework for an hour and have nothing to do all day because my husband and I are both working. The same goes for my middle schooler who either has face-to-face -face friends over or is interacting with them through video games or social media, which is completely unhealthy. Lastly, my kindergartner is very much lost on our not in-person days. His attention span is limited when trying to be taught through a screen. I work out of the house on some of the days and my husband's job is very demanding of his attention right now. I can relate to many families where we're saying you have to keep quiet, find something to do, and I'm so sorry. So why don't you ask the parents that are hybrid how they think they're doing because we're not doing well and assigning more work without a live teacher was not a good plan. It's actually created a lot more tension, tears, and arguments in my home. We, many hybrid parents, feel that our opinion doesn't matter at the end of the day, and we're noticing depression on many levels. Hi. I beg you to hear us. Thank you. Comment 31. Chris Craw. CDC confirmed, to stay, confirmed today that schools are not the main source of community spread, and that children's education is too important to not return to in-person. If the CDC making these recommendations, what more confirmation does the district need? We have systems in place to protect students and teachers. Is there a way to take a consensus of teachers who do not feel safe and keep them teaching the virtual students and let others return who are not compromised themselves or through their families? Why is only one side of the community's needs being serviced? Those who only want virtual are being satisfied, but what about those who want in person to return more than two days, which is not ideal? Our kids' mental and emotional well-being is just as important, if not more, than the K-6 children's education limitations with Zoom learning. I would agree more. You can catch up academically, but how do you catch up, catch, but how do you catch uh, mentally and emotionally once that downward spiral is set in motion? Comment 32. Tammy Samos. Thank you. <clears throat> to Mr. Cook for acknowledging the role of parents this school year. As parents, we feel invisible. 
As parents, we feel like we have no voice. I appreciate the efforts to fix hybrid, but honestly, there wasn't much improvement in the outcome. My child is still struggling on the day she is at home. We asked to see the grades and we heard the academics don't matter. This is the greatest indicator of how well things have been, been going. Board members, please represent our students who have had no voice for over a year. Vote to return all hybrid students to full-time in person by March 1st. Panita Thurman. I'm writing tonight as the parent of three children who have benefited from the in-person learning model that the district launched in September. Over the year, my children have learned and grown under the care of dedicated, committed, and relentless teachers and administrators. My children have had the opportunity to be in person to learn and be safe for our family and for teachers and staff to work within established safety guidelines of social distancing and mask use. Moreover, we have not experienced as a community the kind of disruption of required quarantine by many children as in the districts around us that have not maintained social distance guidelines. I do not want that for my children. As per tonight's discussion around the metrics and the process the district will use to explore how and when to accelerate more days of in-person learning, thank you for sharing clear data-driven measures and insights that guide your decision-making. My family made the decision to continue our learning mode <clears throat> as asked in December on the explicit assumption agreed upon by the board to watch the data as a measure of when to reduce safety measures like social distancing. I fully expect that you will honor that commitment you made. My voice and interest as a parent should be as valuable as those vocal parents who are calling for an immediate return to school. The idea of an arbitrary date for students to return without a regard to data or the complexity of va vaccination of our frontline educators is reckless and unfair. In closing, I want to thank each member of the board and administration for your gracious commitment, regardless of whether you agree with my opinion, to show up as professional caring adults who understand the immense responsibility you bear as trustees to balance the conflicting views across our community. This is not about listening to one group or another. This continues to be about showing up as the leadership entrusted by your community to make tough and hard decisions that are in the best interest of the entire community of students and family. Though I understand some who share a different opinion than I, than I rooted in love and worry for their own children's well-being. I'm disappointed at the vitriol and the aggressive tone on social media that I have observed against our board administrators and educators. Thank you again to the teachers, administrators, and staff of NCSD for all that you've done to navigate through this, through the enormous complexity of this year. I hope Hi. as a board, thank you. <clears throat> Comment 34, Mike Petta. It has, become a very, it has become very clear that the administration has no interest in getting these children back to school five days a week. The goalposts continue to be moved and shifted to fit their agenda. The responsibility to get these children the education they desperately need rests solely on the school board. The superintendent's requirement to get kids back to school are unrealistic and quite frankly, lacking context. These numbers will continue to be manipulated in an effort to avoid five day a week return to school. The new president, the governor, the CDC, and many other organizations have stated that kids need to get back to school. Large scale spread of COVID-19 is not occurring in schools regardless of social distancing guidelines. Surrounding school districts have made the change to five day in person without an issue. At the bare minimum, we need to get our youngest students, K-6, back to school as soon as possible. With nearly 50% of students still on a virtual option, the schools will be half full. Why not use the empty classroom space to accommodate the students coming five days per week? Without the school board stepping up and demanding our children return to five day a week schedule, the administration will continue to kick the can down the road until they achieve their goal of keeping our children out of the school for the entire school year. Please do what is right and listen to, the near, to nearly all the experts that are saying our children need to be in school. The kids are counting on you. Comment 35, Sarah Brandon. I have listened to the virtual days and I applaud the high school teachers for being engaging, understanding and fun during this stressful time. I believe high school should remain hybrid the entire year to maintain normalcy and safety. The positivity of these teachers is nothing short of heroic and the kids are safe and learning. Comment 36, Letitia Keller. Hello all, I'm a parent of a fourth grader who attends Village Oaks Elementary. As a product of the Detroit public school system, I take pride in having my children grow up in the Novi School District. Well, I felt that pride until this year. Since March, 2020, I have watched my child become more and more disadvantaged. She is receiving a less than mediocre education at best this school year. I've tried to give the district the benefit of the doubt, but enough is enough. I'm a full-time nurse soon to be a full-time student as well. My husband is a full-time engineer and full-time student. We have, we have our nine-year-old and three-year-old daughters, both of whom demand and deserve attention. For the last year, 
I've had to be a full-time teacher on top of everything else. Everyone in my family is at wit's end. We have struggled with childcare on days when she is not in school, hybrid learning. I have bought books and materials off Amazon to help her gain fourth grade skills that she isn't being taught at school. I've had to teach her these skills and give her assignments to complete. I'm doing this with my nine-year-old child at 9 p.m. at night because she's barely learning anything in school. Enough is enough. We need to stop keeping our children out of school to protect adults from COVID. Plain and simple. Adults need to figure a protection plan for themselves. I would rather FaceTime grandma and grandpa if that means sending my child to school full time. Kids have remained healthy despite this virus and we have a year of statistics to support that statement. So what are we waiting for? In addition to the lack of education my child receives, I am very concerned about the depression and isolation she's experiencing that will ne negatively impact her for years to come. Do us all a favor and vote to put our kids first for once during this whole ordeal. Vote for full-time in-person instruction to give our kids a fighting chance at a healthy mind, body, and spirit. Comment 37, Beth Ava. Good evening, Dr. Matthews. I truly appreciate all your updates, your transparency, and your dedication to keeping NCSD safe and receiving a quality education. My child are hybrid students at Meadows and in, in, in Novi High School, and I am thoroughly impressed with how well their teachers are handling everything. I appreciate the efforts of, of your staff tremendously. That being said, I'm an elementary teacher in a nearby district and know how absolutely difficult this year is. I also know how scary it can be. I started off teaching hybrid, truly the most difficult way to teach for about eight weeks, then we moved to virtual for 10. I've now been back uh, full face to face with full classes since January 19th. I no longer feel safe. I no longer feel that I can keep my students safe. Yes, we are vigilant about hand washing and sanitizing and wearing masks. They even have desk partitions, but we cannot social distance even three feet. What kind of elementary experience are they getting sitting in their seats all day? Students need to work with partners and in small groups. They need to collaborate. They're missing out on so much learning and discovery if we don't give them these opportunities. Since we've been back within the first four days, we quarantined two and a half classroom classes because two staff members tested positive. One was hospitalized. Last week, I had a COVID scare. I thought my class would be next. Thankfully, both my tests came back negative, but for how long? I know we will shut down again. This year and all these changes in teaching style are taking a huge toll on me mentally and emotionally. You and I both know that we are taking, they are taking a toll on our students and your staff as well. Of course, we want kids back face to face as parents and as teachers, but at what cost? I just ask that you really think about what you're asking of your staff if the board decides to go back five days face to face. I know many parents are angry and saying cruel and hurtful things about your staff and that breaks my heart. It's not up to the teachers and, and many parents don't understand that. We teachers just wanna keep everyone safe. I always tell my students that my number one job is to keep them safe. I don't feel like I'm doing that anymore. I appreciate you looking at this incredibly different, difficult situation from all perspectives. Comment 38, Jessica Peck. Thank you for your hard work this year. I know it's been tough, especially for educators. The fact of the matter is deciding whether or not to bring Novi schools back to school full-time boils down to an assessment of risk. Is it more risky to continue to utilize the hybrid model, potentially harming students' educational experience as well as their mental health and social development? Or is it more risky to bring kids back full-time and not socially distance? This is a terrible choice and I'm glad that I'm not the one who has to make the decision. That said, I'm curious what specifically is leading Novi School District to evaluate the risk differently than those uh, of most other surrounding districts, which are moving to in-person instruction four to five days per week, that are also likely looking at similar COVID stats. In comment 39, Lisa Seal. The teacher community has a teacher's union to represent them. They have administrators backing them. This is how we, this is how we have balance in a school district. The results of the votes each meeting tells the community that you are not representing us, that you're simply backing what Dr. Matthews wants. The balance of reputation is off in Novi, and that onus falls on you as a collective board. By allowing Dr. Matthews to continue to make decisions about the opening of school four plus days a week for all schools, you are failing the students. Every single district around us is opening up. Why not Novi? Why is Dr. Matthews making it next to impossible for grades seven to 12 to return to full time in person? Represent the students, please. Vote for the students. Demand that Dr. Matthews give a date of March 1st for the return to full time in person for all grade levels. And that, Dr. Ruskin, is all of the public comment. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Thank you to the public for sharing their perspective and their feedback. We always appreciate hearing from you. We'll move on to our next um, agenda item, which is the consent agenda. Um, 
On the consent agenda tonight, we have two parts. We have part A, which is approval of minutes, the regular meeting minutes of January 21st, 2021, and B, the approval of bills, board report check register for November 2020, and the purchase card report for October 1st, 2020 through October 30th, 2020. If I can get a recommendation, Mr. Mena? Yeah, I move that, I better check that I'm unmuted. Okay, I move that um, the Novi Community School Board approve consent items as presented. Support. support. Recommended by Mr. Mena and supported by Mrs. Murphy. If we can get a roll call vote, Mr. Mena. Trustee Cook. Yes. Trustee Hood. Yes. Trustee Mena, yes. Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Roney. Yes. Trustee Ruskin. Yes. And Trustee Smith. He's there. Trustee Smith. He's I'll there. take a yes. I saw a swap. Yes, sorry. Okay. Okay, motion carries seven to zero. We'll move to our action items. We have five action items this evening. We will start with action item A, the personnel report, Dr. Matthews. Thank you, Dr. Ruskin, and we will turn to Dr. Kinzer. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Uh, this evening, we have a brief report. Uh, one new hire, George Bronson, health, physical education, and computer teacher at Novi High School as well as Novi Middle School. And one resignation, Jessica Bornowski, English language arts teacher at Novi Middle School. Thank you, Dr. Kinzer. If I may get a recommendation, Mr. Cook? Yes, so I uh, recommend that the Novi Community School District Board of Education adopts the personnel report recommendations as presented. Support. Recommended by Mr. Cook, supported by Mrs. Roney. Any questions or discussion? Mr. Mena? Uh, Dr. Kinzer, um, so it was nice to see that we could hire a PE teacher that, that somehow has the ability to teach computer science as well. I think that's a bonus. Uh, is that something we would normally be able to see? Because uh, I know you and I have had this conversation in the past uh, regarding certification for computer science teachers. How is, that, um, how is it that we can find some way to teach computer science um, that has, uh, who really doesn't have a, a um, computer science certification because it's really not available anymore. So that, that's exactly it. So recently the Michigan Department of Education uh, eliminated certification uh, to teach computer science. So it, there's not a specific certification requirement, but there is a skill requirement. And um, Mrs. Carter and Mr. Baker um, in their interview process determined that Mr. Bronson is capable of that. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mena. Mrs. Murphy? I just want to say I'm really sad. I got to be on the bus with Jessica Pernowski at the um, field trip. She is a fantastic teacher. I am going to, I, I'm disappointed she's leaving us, but um, I definitely wish her the best at whatever she's going on to next. She's young, and I know the kids really loved her, the kids that had her on the bus, and I got to see her interact. And yeah, I'm going to, I guess I won't be going to the eighth grade field trip with her again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Murphy. Any other questions or comments before we take our vote? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Mano, we're ready for a roll call vote, please. Trustee Cook. Yes. Trustee Hood. Yes. Trustee Mena. Yes. Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Roney. Yes. Trustee Ruskin. Yes. Trustee Smith. Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Our next action item is the IB Career um, Program Proposal. Dr. Matthews. Thank you, Dr. Ruskin. Elena uh, Brown, teacher and IB coordinator at Nova High School, and Sarah Leppard, counselor at Nova High School, would like to propose the Nova High School offer an international baccalaureate career program. In light of the Michigan Department of Education Career Readiness Initiative and student interest, the addition of this program would complement the existing diploma program and give more IB opportunities to all students at the high school. Uh, this was discussed at uh, the January 21st meeting. We also uh, were able to provide additional information to the board uh, 
via a survey that uh, Ms. Brown gave to her students. And we do have Ms. Brown and uh, Ms. Lepart here this evening to answer any questions if the board has them before they take this vote. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. If I can get a recommendation, please. Mrs. Murphy? No, I will move that the Novi Community School District Board of Education approve the addition of the IB career program, diploma career program. Support. Oh, that was so quiet. Mr. Mena, was that you? Support, yes, sorry. Okay. Recommended by Mrs. Murphy and supported by Mr. Mena. Are there any questions um, for Ms. Lephart or Ms. Brown? I know we had a robust discussion regarding this last time. They gave a really nice presentation and answered um, our questions that we had. I should. Yes, please. Sorry, but I should mention that uh, Ms. Brown, just reminding her, she promised me that two years from now, she was going to come back here or email me and let me know how this was going. And, and uh, let's make a big deal, too, once we're able to get beyond just offering this for marketing and marketing and... Uh, Help me out here. Finance. 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 All right. So um, when uh, when we're able to offer this for, for something outside of, of those two, I think that would be a, a time of celebration, especially if, um, you know, we're successful with, with the uh, two options that, that we're opening it up with. Thank you, Mr. Mena. I agree with you on that. I think that there's um, so much potential here with all the different career paths that our students may have interest in. Okay, seeing no other questions, comments. Um, Mr. Mena, if we can get a roll call vote, please. Trustee Cook. Yes. Trustee Hood. Yes. Trustee Mena, yes. Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Roney. Yes. Trustee Ruskin. Yes. And Trustee Smith. Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you for all your hard work, Mr. We uh, Dr. Weber. Uh, I'd like to take this moment to please thank uh, Miss Elena Brown and Miss Sarah Lephart. Uh, they were with us in the meeting, listened to Dr. Matthews read uh, all the comments that he did. Uh, thank you for both of you for that. Well, uh, Steve has those dulcet tones. Some of those words can be hard to hear, especially knowing that you've spent two years pursuing something that's truly good for kids uh, behind the scenes. A unique nature of being a public employee is that you get to come in public and be asked questions and everyone can watch you and hear you. You've handled yourself with grace and absolute aplomb. I really appreciate it. This is great for our kids. And you two represent what uh, we're fortunate to get to see on a daily basis here in Novi, which are staff members who don't lo go looking for the accolades, but simply quietly kick butt for our kids on the daily. And I thank both of you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to share this with you. We'll be back in a year to present our, our data. <laughs> I come back every fall. I try to. Great. Thank you again for everything. All righty. Next, we have um, our third action item, which is bid package number four, high school HVAC. Dr. Matthews. Thank you, Dr. Ruskin. Uh, on uh, Tuesday, November 24th, 2020, and Thursday, to December 17th, 2020, sealed bids were received and publicly opened for the Novi High School Security Entry Editions Category 142 HVAC. In attendance for the bid opening were representatives from the Novi Community School District, Plant Moran Cressa, TMP Architecture, McCarthy Smith, and interested bidders. Bids were opened, recorded, and tabulated through a Zoom meeting. The project team uh, conducted post-bid interviews with each of the following qualified bidders for each bid division of work. During the post-bid interview, the project team reviewed the scope of, of work, project schedule, manpower requirements, and specified materials with each of the contractors. Based upon the project team's review of the proposals and bidders, we proposed the following recommendations to the Novi Community School District for contract award. Uh, to uh, Goyette Mechanical for $535,118. Uh, and so that is the award recommendation amount. And we would ask the board to approve this um, uh, recommendation this evening. We do have Ms. Agnes Arbuckle here uh, uh, from uh, McCarthy Smith, who uh, presented uh, this uh, back on January 21st. Uh, and so she's available to answer any additional questions. Uh, Mr. McIntyre is also here and Dr. Kinzer, who are part of the bond team. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. If I can get a recommendation. Okay, I'll, 
I'll move that the Novak Community School District Board of Education approve the recommended bid to Goyette Mechanical for $535,118. And I get a support. support. Recommended by Mrs. Murphy and supported by Mrs. Hood. Any uh, further discussion points or questions? Okay, seeing none, um, I would like to ask for a roll call vote, Mr. Mena. Trustee Cook? Yes. Trustee Hood? Yes. Trustee Mena? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Roney? Yes. Trustee Ruskin? Yes. And Trustee Smith? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. I wanna thank Mrs. Arbuncle for um, always being here to answer questions and to go through all these discussions as she works really diligently with her team um, with all these different bond uh, projects that we are currently working on in the district. So we always appreciate having you here and all the hard work that you're doing for us. Oh, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Have a good night. Good night. Um, okay, next we have secure entry and classroom office technology um, action item, Dr. Matthews. Thank you, Dr. Ruskin. Uh, IDS worked with district technology staff, TMP Architecture, McCarthy Smith, Plant Moran, uh, to determine the needs in coordination with the design and construction plans for the secure entry renovations at Novi High School, Novi Middle School, Orchard Hills Elementary, and Village Oaks Elementary. The systems acquired and installed will be an expansion of the existing district secure access system and include providing card access readers, control systems for controllable door hardware, intercom systems, and all programming necessary to interface uh, new hardware with the existing access uh, control fire and ADA systems. IDS also worked with district technology staff, TMP architecture, McCarthy Smith and Plant Moran to determine the needs in coordination with the design and construction plans for the classroom and office renovations and additions at Nova High School, Nova Middle School, Orchard Hills Elementary and Village Oaks. These systems acquired and installed will be an expansion of the existing district data network and audiovisual systems. They include providing uh, data network drops, wireless access points, flat panel displays, sound reinforcement and presentation systems, and all programming necessary for operation and interfacing with the new hardware with existing data and audiovisual systems. On uh, Thursday, December 17th, 2020 at 3 p.m., sealed bids were received and publicly opened. Bids were opened and recorded. Three firms submitted bids for the secure access systems and in, include providing card access readers, control systems for controllable door hardware, intercom systems, and all programming necessary to interface new hardware with the existing access control fire and ADA system. Security designs, uh, Jamerlo uh, systems integration and security 101 uh, bid on this project. Um, IDS recommends awarding the secure entry renovation technology to Security 101 in the amount of $71,316.61. IDS also recommends a district managed contingency of $7,132. Four firms submitted bids for the classroom and office renovations that would include providing data network drops, <clears throat> wireless access points, flat panel displays, and sound reinforcement and presentation systems, and all programming necessary for operation and interfacing the new hardware with existing data and audiovisual systems. Uh, we had um, four bidders for this, and IDES recommends a award of the classroom and office renovation technology project to digital age technologies in the amount of $255,641. IDS also recommends a district managed contingency of $25,000, $25,564. This came before the board for information and discussion on the January 21st, 2021 board meeting and come back, comes back tonight for approval. And we do have um, some technology um, gurus here tonight, uh, Mr. Anthony Lacricchio and, and Jeff Maas. Uh, and so they would be able to respond to any questions you might have, but we did have a fairly robust discussion of this back on January 21st. Uh, Dr. Kinzer and uh, Mr. McIntyre, also part of the bond team might be able to support us as well. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. If I can get a recommendation, please. <coughs> Mrs. Hood. Yeah, I recommend that the Novak Community School District Board of Education award the Secure Entry Renovation Technology Project to Security 101 in the amount of $71,316.61 with a district managed contingency of $7,132. Uh, 
In addition, the Board of Education award the Classroom and Office Renovation Technology Project to Digital Age Technologies in the amount of $255,641 with a district managed contingency of $25,000. $564. I'll support. Recommended by Mrs. Hood and supported by Mrs. Roney. Mrs. Murphy, you have a question? Yeah, can can someone just refresh my memory on the like the price difference and why we didn't go to lowest? I know that we talked about that last time. I don't see that. Normally we have little star as to why we would go with one that was so much higher. Um, we apologize for that, uh, Ms. Murphy. The two lowest bidders were incomplete. They only bid on a portion of the project. So they only bid on the cabling portion, not the entire scope of the project. That's what the difference in the pricing. Okay, I appreciate that. It probably would be a good idea like a public record to kind of note those because it's obviously double and we don't want the public to think like we're, yeah, you know what it's talking. You yep, we'll make that note and make that improvement for next time. Okay, great. Thanks, Moz. Thank you, Mrs. Murphy, and thanks, Moz, for answering that question and getting that taken care of. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Mena, we're ready for a roll call vote, please. Trustee Cook? Yes. Trustee Hood? Yes. Trustee Mena? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Roney? Yes. Trustee Ruskin. Yes. Trustee Smith. Yes. Recommendation carries seven to zero. We will now move on to um, actually thank you, Anthony and Jeff. We appreciate you. I don't know if you'll be on the call with us any longer, so I don't want to be dismissive and not thank you for all your work on this uh, particular item. So again, thanks for everything. And thank you for my new microphone. Um, we're going to move on to action item, which is our final action item. It's action item E, so it is the COVID metrics. Dr. Matthews. Thank you, Dr. Ruskin. This has been a very challenging school year. We continue to look for ways to create that five-day-a-week in-person option for our students. That is the common goal for Nova Community School District parents, Board of Education, teachers, and administrators. To do so, we must find ways to balance the safety and educational needs of our students and staff. The administrative team recognizes that it's been 11 months since our Novi students have had a traditional school experience. We recognize that our hybrid and virtual class experiences present both opportunities and challenges. We recognize that the demands of this year on our families have created challenges and struggles as parents and students juggle competing demands and work and school schedules. Most importantly, we recognize the toll that this experience is taking on our students and staff. A second semester started on January 25th. We had students walk through our doors who had not been inside of their schools for months. We have students who are new to the district who have not seen their classroom or the inside of their school even now. This we know has limited their social interactions and had a tremendous emotional uh, toll on them and their families. Students do not have access to the same experiences that they had pre-pandemic and there is a toll on their mental and social emotional health. Concerts, plays, after school activities, athletics, these and many more experiences have all been limited or non existent for 11 months. Social in person interaction with other students and with teachers has been significantly reduced for over 11 months, and this has had a negative impact. There's also been a toll on the mental health of our staff, especially our teaching staff. We have asked them to teach in two modalities virtual and hybrid. We have asked them to find ways to engage students in non traditional ways. We have asked them to reimagine how to teach, teach while living through a pandemic. Our teachers have spent time learning new skills and planning new lessons, and that has taken time away from their families and other activities. We have asked administrators to manage two learning modalities within their building. We have asked administrators to reimagine how to service students in a virtual and hybrid world. The concern and worry of our administrative staff is clearly visible. We have asked staff to find ways to feed students and to transport students and to provide technology to students in ways that we have never done before. And we have done this while offering an in-person and a virtual option since September 8th, 2020, when many districts around us chose to only offer a virtual option. I've been told that our current hybrid and virtual approach approaches work for students. I've been told that our current hybrid and virtual approaches do not work for students. I've received praise for our current hybrid and virtual approaches. 
I have received criticism for our current hybrid and virtual approaches. Over the course of this school year, we have done many things to support our students to try and mitigate the impact of the unusual circumstances we have found ourselves in. The partial list of some of these intentional efforts made to engage students includes hired seven retired teachers to support students, started a tutoring program to support students in grades five through 12, created virtual intervention services for students, distributed technology devices to students, distributed whiteboards to all students, created social emotional lessons at all levels, intentionally solicited feedback from students, created virtual student activities, for example, the virtual homecoming activities at the high school, created new to Novi counseling group, provided staff professional development on virtual learning, created virtual meetings and clubs for students after school, redeployed instructional coaches to work with students, reached out to support students through Zoom conferences with teachers and administrators. Teachers report that students are learning. I have visited classrooms and talked with teachers and have seen our students learn. In our buildings, I have seen our teachers working. I've talked with our teachers about the instruction they have provided. I have great confidence that our teachers are working hard and in many instances working harder than they have in the past trying to juggle virtual and in-person lessons, learning new technology, creating connections with students, developing new methods of assessment, engaging students, and so much more. I understand that parents are frustrated because of the unique nature of this school year. I know that our staff are frustrated as well. The most important question at this point is when can we return to normal? When can we either return to a five-day in-person instruction or increase the amount of in-person instruction for our students? In Novi, we have charted a course that is focused on two priorities, education and safety. I believe that we have created a safe environment. We can look at the COVID dashboards of districts with a physical proximity to Novi. And in Novi, uh, for the week of January 5th, or January 25th, we had four positive cases and we quarantined four people. Uh, in Wald Lake, they had seven positive cases and they quarantined 56 people. Huron Valley, they had six positive cases and, and quarantined 156 people. South Lyon had six positive cases and quarantined 30 people. Northville had three positive cases and, and quarantined 60 people. Uh, total cases from September 2020 in Novi is 58 uh, and a total quarantine of less than 100. Wald Lake, 203 with a total quarantine of 926. Huron Valley, 124 cases with a total quarantine of 545. South Lyon, total cases of 64. And uh, on their COVID dashboard, they only list the quarantines in, uh, since January 8th, and there have been 122. In Northville, there have been 159 cases with total quarantine of 570. These numbers demonstrate that in Novi, we have found a way to keep our students and our staff safe in our schools. We have also found ways to provide a quality educational experience for our students. It is not the typical experience, but in my visits to classrooms and in my conversations with teachers, I have seen quality lessons and quality teaching. None of us anticipated that the impact of the pandemic would last from March 16th, 2020 through today. But the COVID numbers are higher now than they were when we made the decision to create a hybrid and virtual option to begin the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, back on uh, um, the week of uh, September 8th, when we started school, we had 12.2 uh, cases uh, uh, per 10,000 residents in our district. Um, the, the numbers from uh, last week were 31.6. Uh, I must uh, um, identify that the numbers for this week, um, uh, the last two week period reported by the county today, um, uh, for uh, January 21st through uh, February 3rd, uh, we are at uh, 21.3. We are still struggling with the pandemic. We're learning about the impact of the pandemic on different age groups. At our last meeting, I presented information that showed the impact by age group. And as you can see, there's about 40% of the cases are in the age groups of five through nine and 10 through 13, and about uh, between 55 and 60% of the cases are in the age group of 14 to 18. These numbers show that students age five through nine and 10 through 13 are less impacted by the virus. These would be our students in grades K through six. In our county, it is important to remember that many of our students in these age groups have not been in school during the first five months of the school year. How that fact impacts these numbers is not known. And while these numbers give us hope, the CDC reminds us that there's an impact on all ages. In guidance from the CDC, on issues related to school return, we learned some important points. 
While fewer children than adults have COVID-19 in the United States, the number of school-aged children with COVID-19 has been increasing. Children and adolescents can be infected with a virus that causes COVID-19, can get sick with COVID-19, and can spread the virus to others. Most children and adolescents with a virus that causes COVID-19 have mild symptoms, and some have no symptoms at all. The symptoms of COVID-19 are similar in adults and children and can look like other common illnesses such as colds, strep throat, influenza, or allergies. Children, like adults who are infected but have no symptoms, can still spread the virus to others. While the number of children who have been hospitalized with COVID-19 has been low compared with adults, one-third of hospitalized children with COVID-19 have been admitted to the intensive care unit. Because children with a virus that causes COVID-19 can spread it to other children and to adults, it is important to take measures to minimize risk of spread in school settings. Resuming and maintaining in-person learning may pose risks to children, teachers, school administrators, and other staff in the school environment and their families and household members. Among adults, older age and having un among adults, older age and having underlying medical conditions increases the risk for severe illness from COVID-19. The many benefits of in-person schooling should be weighed against the risk of spreading COVID-19 in the school and community. The CDC presents a scale of risk from low to high. The lowest risk is an all virtual environment. The next level is some risk, then medium risk, then higher risk, and highest risk. In the some risk category, hybrid learning model, where most students and teachers participate in virtual learning and some students and teachers engage in in-person learning with small in-person classes, activities, and events, cohorting and alternating or staggered schedules rigorously applied, no mixing of groups of students and teachers throughout or across the school day, no sharing of objects between students and teachers. Students, teachers, and staff following all steps to protect themselves and others at all times, including proper use of face masks, social distancing, and hand hygiene. Regularly scheduled and consistent uh, cleaning of frequently touched areas. Medium risk, the hybrid learning model, where most students and teachers engage in in-person learning, and some students and teachers participate in virtual learning with larger in-person classes, activities, and events. Cohorting and alternating or staggered schedules applied with some exceptions. Some mixing of groups of students and teachers throughout and across the school days. Minimal sharing of objects between students and teachers. Students, teachers, and staff following all steps to protect themselves and others, such as proper use of face masks, social distancing, and hand hygiene. Regularly scheduled cleaning of frequently touched surfaces. Higher risk, students and teachers engage entirely in in-person learning activities and events with some mixing of groups of students and teachers throughout across school days. Some sharing of objects between students and teachers. Students, teachers, and staff following some steps to protect themselves and others, such as proper use of face masks, social distancing, and hand hygiene. Irregular cleaning of frequently touched areas. Highest risk, students and teachers engage entirely in in-person learning activities and events with students mixing freely between classes and activities, students and teachers freely sharing objects, students, teachers, and staff do not or are not following steps to protect themselves and others, such as proper use of face masks, social distancing, and hand hygiene irregular cleaning of frequently touched areas. I would suggest that we are currently operating at the sum and medium risk levels. The State of Michigan guidance, State of Michigan guidelines for operating schools safely discusses safety protocols. We meet most of these, designated COVID-19 point of contact, attempt to cohort, personal protective equipment, hand hygiene, and ventilation. But the report provides this guidance for spacing and movement. Spacing and movement, the recommendations are maintain six feet of distance at all times. In instructional settings, space desks six feet apart, making creative use of all school spaces, gyms, cafeterias, multi-purpose rooms. The physical distancing of six feet cannot be maintained in instructional settings with an all in-person approach. Schools should consider alternative strategies to reduce student density. This may include the use of a hybrid schedule that allows students to maintain six feet of distancing and attend in-person school for at least half time. If a school district nonetheless proceeds with in-person learning, at a minimum, it should maintain mi mi minimum seated distance of three feet in classrooms. Consider the feasibility of installing barriers or partitions for additional risk mitigation. Ensure that when students are eating at lunch with mask off, they maintain six feet of physical distance to the extent feasible. Class sizes should be kept to the level afforded by the spacing guidance listed above. If, we're bring, if we were to bring back all of our hybrid students, we would be hard pressed in many classrooms to provide even three feet of space between students and desks. We created hybrid classrooms that when combined may exceed the typical class size for Novi 
because we knew that on hybrid days, they would have under 15 students. It's been safe to school five days a week. So no, I should as well. In my experience, basing the conclusion on the argument that everyone else is doing it, so I should too, has never been the best way to convince someone that I am right. And in this particular case, the argument is also not true. I've uh, listed the Oakland County districts and their approach, and, and these approaches keep changing based on circumstances. For example, today, uh, I talked with uh, the uh, interim superintendent in Birmingham, and they are uh, uh, currently scheduled to come back uh, with their hybrid students to full-time face-to-face uh, -face, uh, on March 15th. Uh, Bloomfield Hill superintendent told me this week that uh, he was uh, bringing a recommendation to his board on February 11th to at some point bring students back, the hybrid students back uh, to school. Uh, but as you can see, there are many variations uh, throughout the county um, um, of, of how to uh, bring students back into the classroom uh, safely. Uh, South Lyon uh, voted last night uh, to allow secondary students to attend uh, their two assigned days and the other two if they wish uh, starting February 22nd. Folks from homes can still join in via Google Meet. Students have three class blocks a day. On day A, they have three class periods, and on day B, they have three class periods. Um, Troy, uh, they have four days face-to-face -face at the secondary level, but uh, in talking with their superintendent, that is because only 25% of their students at the secondary level uh, have come back face-to-face. Uh, in talking with a parent in Troy today, uh, he indicates that that is uh, the same at the elementary level as well. They only have 25% of their students uh, back uh, in face-to-face, -face, uh, so 75% are virtual. Uh, Northville, uh, they, their students are back uh, five days face-to-face -face at the elementary level, but they cohort, uh, and, and so they uh, create uh, class sizes of 20 or less. And if they don't have enough teachers, they have an aide that would be with uh, one of the classrooms. While the teach, for example, if they have three classrooms and only two teachers, uh, the two teachers uh, will rotate through the three classrooms and the aide is there uh, in the other classroom uh, uh, during the day. As seen in this chart, there are a variety of approaches in Oakland County to returning to school. In the Novi Community School District, we made the conscious choice to provide a hybrid and a virtual format in our return to school plan. We did so for several reasons, not the least of which was the importance placed on social distancing. The discussion we are now having really comes down to an issue of social distancing. We can meet all of the safety protocols spelled out by the CDC in the state of Michigan, mask, improved ventilation, hand washing, disinfecting services, and social distancing with our current hybrid approach. If we bring hybrid students back to school together, we cannot meet the social distancing recommendations from the CDC or the state of Michigan. In December, we invited parents to recommit for second semester. In asking for that recommitment, we informed parents that the goal would be to try and return students back to five-day in-person instruction during second semester if the conditions warranted that for our students. We were clear that if parents were uncomfortable with, the possi with that possibility, then the choice for their children should be virtual. However, in saying that, it must be noted that if we return to five-day in-person instruction, we cannot have social distance. Without social distance, the school day would look different than the school day looks now. Children would remain at their desk for the majority of the day. Desk would face one direction to limit face-to-face -face interaction. We would not have space for students to engage in safe, socially distant activities in the classroom. Teachers would teach from the front of the room in a whole class format. Teachers could walk through the classroom aisles, but one-on-one -on -one classroom instruction, interaction, and support would be minimal. Lunch would be limited to, to the cafeterias and be in classrooms or be in the lunchroom, but keeping students apart as much as possible. The majority of teachers and school staff are not vaccinated at this point. Uh, it was asked earlier how many of our staff are vaccinated, uh, how many of our teachers are vaccinated. It, uh, we do not uh, because of uh, HIPAA, uh, we cannot ask them specifically if they have or have not been. Uh, the NEA has done a survey and uh, they had uh, uh, just around 200 of our over 420 uh, teaching staff vaccinated with one dose at this point. <clears throat> um, we believe, although it is not guaranteed that most teachers and school staff will be vaccinated over the next several weeks. 
A final issue is middle and high school students. Our middle and high schools are organized around the six period day. What that means for COVID exposure is that our middle and high school students would have six periods with different groups of students in each classroom. Our teachers would also have exposure to many more students during the course of the day than our elementary and meadows teachers. Students would also be in the hallways six times during the day. This structure increases the number of people each middle and high school student and each middle and high school teacher is exposed to each day. In our elementary schools and meadows, students have reduced movement. These, these students have, been, have a modified cohort and that they are with the students in their classroom for the majority of the day. The difference between middle and high school and elementary and meadows experience makes bringing back middle and high school students a more problematic. The Board of Education has expressed to me a desire to have a plan on how to bring back students to five-day in-person instruction. I will provide that, but before I do, I would like to express my belief that the Board should consider maintaining our current approach. I strong, strongly believe that what we are currently doing is working. Our hybrid and virtual students are learning. Our hybrid and virtual students are safe. Our positive cases and quarantine cases are significantly lower than neighboring districts. When I examine both learning and safety of students and staff, what we are currently doing is working. It is not perfect. We continue to strive to improve our approach, but I know that our students are learning and our students and staff are safe. I know the argument is that other districts are going back, but many of them are not going back full time. Many that are back have higher COVID positive tests and multiple quarantines, and the in-person learning is not the same as what we are providing in our current format. My recommendation would be to continue our current approach to hybrid and virtual options until COVID case counts drop significantly. What I would recommend that we consider, when would I recommend that we consider bringing back our hybrid students? When our COVID numbers drop close to what they were when we started the school year, under 20 cases per 10,000 in our school district, average of under 25 in our three zip codes, and under 125 average daily case counts in Oakland County. But the board has been clear that you would like to consider an alternative approach. At the January 21st, 2021 Board of Education meeting, <clears throat> I suggested that we could look to return to a five day a week in-person instruction if the COVID-19 case counts met certain thresholds. I have made some revisions to those recommendations and include the information on a secondary return. K-6 hybrid students could return to school five days a week if case counts per 10,000 residents in the Novi Community School District as reported on the Oakland County Health Division COVID website were at or below 30 for three consecutive weeks. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> these are the, they came out with their numbers today for, for this uh, last uh, uh, two week period, uh, the January 21st through February 3rd, and they were at 21.3. Uh, um, case count averages for the three Novi zip codes uh, are at uh, or below 55 for three consecutive weeks as calculated. Um, uh, by tracking daily numbers given at the Oakland County Health Division website. So there are the three um, uh, last three weeks. Um, if you looked at the numbers today, uh, um, uh, the numbers for this week, uh, uh, February 2nd, 3rd, or 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, they have gone down each day. They started uh, the week at 50.17, um, and they're down, uh, the, the numbers reported today are at 40.23. 14-day average case counts in Oakland County are at or below 200 for three consecutive weeks as reported on the Oakland County Health Division weekly COVID-19 report. Uh, the last three week averages uh, are listed there. Um, I, I believe uh, the report came out today. Um, I don't believe I have the number in front of me, but it was uh, under, I think it was 168 uh, for um, the last uh, uh, reporting period that came out today. K-6 hybrid students would stay in five day a week school unless numbers begin to trend in the wrong direction. And I and I identify uh, the case counts would go above 45 for three consecutive weeks. Above the case count averages in the zip codes would be above 75 for three consecutive weeks. And the case counts in Oakland County would be above 275 for three consecutive weeks. <clears throat> Taking into account the increased movement and the increased exposure to multiple groups of students, seven to 12 hybrid students could return to school five days a week if Case counts per 10,000 residents in the Novi Community School District as reported on the Oakland County Health Division COVID website were at or below 20 for three consecutive weeks. Um, case counts uh, average for the three zip codes uh, um, were at or below 40. And the 14-day average case counts in Oakland County were at or below 125. 
uh, and uh, if those numbers trended in the wrong direction again, uh, uh, above 40 um, in, in the district count for three consecutive weeks, above 60 in the zip codes, and above 225 uh, for the case counts for the county. At this point, with these metrics, we have, we have not met the thresholds outlined above. Although, uh, with the numbers today, it appears that uh, potentially this would be week one um, uh, for the case six if, if uh, you approve those numbers today. Uh, and uh, um, um, uh, that's kind of how I read the numbers at this point. But to re reiterate, my preferred recommendation would be to continue our current model until COVID-19 case Cases were under 20 cases per 10,000 in our school district, average under 25 in our three zip codes and under 125 on daily case counts. And so I present uh, these following recommendations to the board. Recommendation one stands alone. It can be ignored or voted up or down. If it is approved, the other recommendations do not need to be voted on. If recommendation one is ignored or fails, then move to recommendations two, three, and four. So the Recommendation one is that the Novi Community School District Board of Education continue our current model until COVID-19 cases reach these thresholds. If these thresholds are met for three weeks in a row, hybrid students would return to school for five days per week in-person instruction. Case count per 10,000 residents in the Novi Community School District as reported on the Oakland County Health Division COVID website were at or below 20 cases. Uh, case count <coughs> average of the three Novi zip codes um, in is at or below 25 per 10,000 for three consecutive weeks. And the 14 day average case counts in Oakland County are at or below 125. If recommendation one fails or is not voted on, then move to these recommendations. So recommendation two is that the Novi Community School District Board of Education return case six hybrid students to five day a week in-person learning. If the COVID-19 case counts meet these thresholds, case counts per 10,000 residents in our school district as reported on the Oakland County Health Division COVID website, we're at or below 30 for three consecutive weeks. Case count average for of the three zip codes, at or below 55 for three consecutive weeks. 14 day average case counts in Oakland County are at or below 200 for three consecutive weeks. Uh, case six hybrid students would stay in five day a week unless the numbers begin to trend in the wrong direction. If they went above 45 for the school district, uh, 10,000 residents, uh, uh, that the case count average for the three zip codes would go above 75 and case counts in Oakland County would go above 275. Recommendation three, that the Novi Community School District Board of Education approve returning seven to 12 hybrid students to five day a week in person learning if our COVID-19 case counts meet these thresholds. Case counts per 10,000 residents in the Novi Community School District uh, were at or below 20 for three consecutive weeks. Case count average for the three zip codes were at or below 40 for three consecutive weeks and the 14 day average case counts were at or below 125. And again, uh, we would move out of uh, five day a week if the case counts per 10,000 residents in our district numbers went above 40, that the case count average in the three zip codes went above 60 and the case counts went above 225. And then recommendation four would be that the Board of Education direct the superintendent to communicate weekly the status on meeting thresholds to the parent and school community that the Board of Education administrative team work collaboratively with teachers and support staff to ensure that plans are in place to begin five-day in-person uh, instruction for hybrid students when the thresholds are met and that virtual students remain virtual as per their choice in December. And so that is my report this evening, Dr. Ruskin. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Okay, so, um, board members just so that we have a little clarity on what's happening here so we have recommendation one um, which we um, if someone wants to move that and support that that will be on the table for a vote if they do not we will move on to um, recommendation two three and four um, as presented so um, we'll start with that i will see if there's a board member who would like to move recommendation one Mr. Cook? Yeah, um, I'd actually like to move forward with recommendation one um, in uh, without reading the whole thing, you know, um, <laughs> or do you want me to read the whole thing again? Um, I think that Dr. Matthews read it and unless someone, a uh, board member has a specific concern and wants to hear it out loud, then they can raise our, their hand. 
Um, and then I'll give you an opportunity to talk if indeed it gets supported and gets put on the floor. Agreed. So do we have support? Mr. Mena, you're on mute. Sorry. I just said I thought it would be proper for him to call for a motion uh, to support recommendation one as presented. If okay. that's what he's asking for, then yeah. I think that's, that would be I the call official for, call for a motion. Okay, I call for a motion for recommendation one um, as presented. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Do we have support? Okay. Seeing no support, we will move on to recommendation two and three or A and B, if you will. And then after that, we will move on to recommendation four. So let's start with recommendation two. If someone would like to move this motion. Mr. Mena? Yeah, I move that we, we accept recommendation two as presented. Do we have uh, support or a second? I'll, su I'll support it. Recommended by Mr. Mena and supported by Mrs. Murphy. So now the board will have an opportunity for discussion and conversation in this regard before I ask for a vote. Anybody have any comments, questions, Mr. Mena? Oh, Ms. Hood, sorry, you were just off mute, Mr. Mena. That's why I was calling on you, but Mr. Ms. Hood, go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, so I've got two things I wanted to um, just mention here. So the um, Michigan Health Department today announced that they, well, I read it in the paper today, that they were shifting um, vaccines. So they've been distributing vaccines on a 60%, 40% basis hospitals to local health departments and or maybe that's the opposite and next week the point is next week they are shifting more vaccines to local health departments and I think it is through our local health departments that our teachers are able to um, as part of the 1b cohort of prioritization for receiving vaccines I believe they will have a higher opportunity um, of winning the lottery and, and um, uh, being able to get a vaccine. Dr. Matthews, do you have any comment on that or do you know? Uh, I was in a meeting uh, today with the Oakland County Health Division and, and that uh, uh, supports the conversation that we had with them that, that they are increasing the number of vaccines available to that uh, 1B cohort, uh, which includes uh, teachers. And so uh, their expectation is that um, more teachers in the coming uh, few weeks will get vaccines. Okay. And then secondly, Dr. Ruskin, I have a second comment and it's going to be a question. So um, we have been reminded again tonight and we are reminded repeatedly that um, Nova has been identified as the number one school district in the state. In fact, just today was a, um, an article in I don't know this journal, K-12 Dive, but it was a story about our whiteboards. And they said that Novi is ranked the number one school district in Michigan and one of the top in the country by niche, um, in large part for its academics, according to a spokesman for the ranking site. Um, and then also um, a parent sent to all of us a link to a Detroit Free Press article um, talking about pandemic learning loss, and it was based on the Michigan um, school superintendent maybe considering um, requiring more days, and I may be mischaracterizing that. But anyway, their first sentence was, students are falling behind regardless of whether their, their district offers all in-person classes or a hybrid approach to, to courses, which with that in mind, you know, as we've spent many, many hours now over the last several months talking about hybrid versus full classroom, and to, to paraphrase one of our commenters tonight, you know, rather than looking at other districts, maybe we should look internally, look at our own history and our own success. 
so I know that one of our principals, maybe the end of last week, uh, it was, I don't know if it was on Twitter, I can't remember, sorry, um, had posted that we were starting our annual assessments, um, which is our, our district's internal accountability. And I think that has gone through this week. Um, and I know at K-12, it's iReady, because I went online and, and looked at that a bit. And then for the 7 to seven to high school is um, the NWA. So I guess my question to Dr. Matthews is, in this, in this argument that the hybrid kids aren't learning, do we have any indication, any initial indication on how our students um, have tested, given that we've started our internal assessments right now? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, I can provide some of that, and then I will turn to Dr. Weber as well. Um, um, we um, have, uh, as you mentioned, started our uh, mid-year uh, evaluation of students. And so in, in the fall of 2019, which was not this school year, but the school year before this school year, we tested our students at the beginning of, of, of the year in the fall. And uh, um, uh, I already break students down into three kind of cohorts uh, when they assess them. Uh, and um, uh, in the fall of 2019, uh, our K-6 students, uh, we had 52% uh, uh, who were um, at or above grade level in the fall, 36% who were within uh, one year of being at grade level, and so we had uh, we had 88 percent of our students were at uh, were close to or above grade level in the fall of 2019. Uh, in the winter of that year, so the winter of 20, which was uh, last January February, uh, when we tested them mid year, uh, that number had gone up to 71 percent in tier one and 22% in tier two. So we had 93% who were uh, uh, either close to or uh, above uh, grade level. Uh, this year, in uh, 2020, in the fall, we tested. And so when our students came back this fall, uh, you'll recall that in 2019, we had 52% in tier one and 36% in the tier two. Uh, this year, we had six, uh, 61%, so up from 52%, uh, and 29% in Tier 2, um, down from 36%. So we had 90% uh, um, um, of our students were close to or above grade level in the fall of 20. And as we look to in the winter here, in, and this is reading data, the math data is still being compiled or will be next week. The reading data shows that we uh, again have 93% of our students in those tier one and tier two ranges on the iReady. And so as we look at that data, it suggests to us that our students have not suffered a significant learning loss over the course of the last 11 months. Uh, that our, when our students came back this fall, uh, uh, they were prepared. Uh, we attribute a lot of that to the effort that the, the parents have put in with their students. Uh, we also attribute a lot of that to the effort that our teachers gave to their students uh, last year, uh, to our summer school experience, to the summer preparedness uh, activities that we had for students, to the Novi Public Library. Uh, there's just a lot of reasons why our students came back uh, more prepared. We're a very fortunate community in that regard. Um, uh, you know, we have great teachers, we have a great community, we have great parents. Uh, but uh, this fall, uh, from the, the fall, September through January, uh, our numbers are continue to be quite strong, and, and we do not see the learning loss that many other districts are talking about. And I'll turn to Dr. Weber to either. Uh, we've heard words like failure, loss, horrible, <laughs> things of that nature. Uh, you know, recently I've been trolled on Twitter for doing something like complimenting our teachers, complimenting our kids. It defies logic to me. And that's where I think data can often be very compel compelling. I'm going to share my screen right now. And the data you're about to see are our children and their performance 
guided by our teachers, our principals, and their parents. One of my favorite basketball players of all time <clears throat> is one Mr. Rashid Wallace. And one of the things he would say is the ball don't lie. Ball either goes in or it doesn't. So let's take a look at this graph. This is a standard view of our K through six grades district in the fall of 2019 and winter 2020 on the left, district fall 2020 and district 2021 over on the right. I will ask you to simply look at the overall score, which will be on the bottom. Hopefully you can see my pointer. This fall, 61, Dr. Matthews was talking about tier one, tier two, and tier three. Uh, was at 61% of our students coming off of the summer. We move now to 74% at tier one with the growth that we've seen. We have not seen a declension. And to compare that to what we saw between the fall of last year in 2019 and the winter of 2020, we're actually doing better. How can this be? I'll tell you how it can be. It is because the intentionality that our staff has put in to preparing lessons and caring for our children is there. It's because our parents have put the effort to care for their kids as we know we're suffering in this pandemic. What we also have, just as a, what I can show you and perhaps another view that might be appealing to some, would be, let's take a look at Novi Woods, the building right over my shoulder. So Novi Woods, if we look at fall 2020 and 2021, you're gonna see a 14% increase in those students in the tier one, uh, a 15% declension of those in tier two and a 1% declension in tier three. Remember, green is good, yellow and red are what we wanna to try to reduce and ameliorate. What Dr. Matthews had talked about earlier was the fact that we have done things like employ uh, seven retired teachers as interventionists to come up and help our students who are the most striving learners, as we would say. Uh, Dr. Matthews read a list of things that we have been trying to do. So when I hear words like nothing and failure, those aren't words that bother me, frankly. Those are words that trouble me because we're talking about our children, we're talking about their teachers, their, their parents, their families, and so on. There is no argument that this pandemic has been exceptionally difficult on many of us uh, socially and emotionally. Uh, we've shared that openly. However, to say in some way, shape, or form that our students and our staff are suffering an absolute failure of our ability to deliver instruction is not accurate. As Rashid Wallace would say, the ball don't lie. You may question, well, how do we know that this is clean data? I can say that I'm super proud of our teachers and our administrators who with the intentionality that they use to monitor the administration of these iReady nationally norm standardized assessments, nothing that we built here in Novi, but something that we use came to be. So for every parent out there who has struggled, for every student who has struggled, for every teacher who's put in countless hours and administrator, thank you. You are not failing. You're not. I'm happy to take any questions that the board may have. Thanks, Dr. Weber. Did that answer your question, Mrs. Hood? Um, it did. Uh, uh, thank you. Okay. I know, um, Mrs. Ronnie, before I turn to you, when we were talking about vaccines, Dr. Kinzer had his hand up, and I didn't want to. You had moved on to question two. And I didn't want to um, interrupt you. So I'm going to give him an opportunity if he has any more to add. I, I was, thank you, Dr. Ruskin. Uh, I was only going to add uh, that in conversation today with Heather Burnside, uh, she did share with me a significant uh, uptick in, in teachers reporting to her that they've received notification that they are uh, ready to schedule their first dose appointment. So. I think we have reason to be optimistic that we are turning a corner and the vaccine is becoming more readily available. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'll move on to um, Mrs. Roney, you were next, please. 
I, I just had a question, RJ. That um, little graph, the, the little testnet, that was all students, right? The virtual and the um, hybrid. Uh, you are correct, Ms. Roney. Thank you for asking that question. No problem. Just checking. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Mena, please. Yeah, Dr. Weber, since you, since you asked, I've, I'm just curious. Um, you know, it looks like the numbers you're showing us look pretty good. Uh, my question is, why the need then to offer pass-fail to students uh, at the high school? There's a combination of social-emotional uh, impacts that are also going on throughout the district, as we know. And that's a choice that parents can make. Uh, the parent is ultimately in charge of choosing that option for their student. So the only thing that a parent need do if they do not believe in it is say no. So are we planning on offering it in normal years when we're out of COVID? You know, there's going to be a huge reflection, hopefully, uh, when, if and when we have some time this summer, uh, as we make some transitions to what we're doing with start times, for instance, next year, in other ways to support kids. What have we learned from this year that can truly be beneficial to students? And what have we learned that we tried that was not beneficial to students? So I cannot answer that question at this time. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weber. You're welcome. Um, Mr. Cook, please. Yeah, um, to get us back on the mass metrics, which uh, I've been pushing for quite a bit here, um, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer in metrics and, and not just picking an arbitrary date to go back like many of the other school districts around us so that uh, we have an idea of, you know, whether um, we're going to contribute to um, the spread. And just because there's no evidence that um, it's not spread with the younger children who are typically asymptomatic, so we don't know those kids have it, and we don't know that they're, they're not spreading it because they're asymptomatic. So I've, I've always pushed for these metrics. Um, the reason I pushed recommendation one, actually, I talked to Dr. Matthews, and I wanted it even tighter than that, um, primarily because of social distancing. Um, I don't think with removing just throwing the kids back in the classroom and going three feet or less between them is um you know even though it says you can but and there's four three additional butts in there with um with uh you know dividers you know um still trying to you know find areas where they can separate and and keep them separate i i don't feel that you know, the safety of everyone, not just the teachers, but the students, the staff, every, you know, everyone um, is worth compromising by saying, oh, three feet's fine. Um, you know, I've been told that, you know, for every study that I quote, somebody can quote a study on the other side, which is probably true. Um, dividers, if you have them on the desk, it doesn't do any good unless the kid's head's on the desk. We don't want the kid's head's on the desk. We want them up paying attention. You know, now it's coming out that, hey, two masks are better than one. Well, the, the air you breathe still goes around the mask more than it goes through the mask. You know, so to eliminate that social distancing is, you know, going to be it, it, to me, the social distancing is, is the big thing. Um, you know, we've had a lot of people mention, and I'm going to have to refer back to some notes here, that, you know, nobody else is recommending any metrics. Well, nobody wants to commit to anything because they don't know. You know, we're trying to draw a line in the sand and live with it. And if we draw the line in, 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 the, in the sand or cement and live with it, then we're doing more than most people are than just picking an arbitrary date, you know, and, and I will not, I will not vote for an arbitrary date. I will, I, I, I will follow data to the end. Um, you know, the, 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 the other reason I wanted tighter is I don't want to go in and out of school. I don't want the kids to be hybrid this week and then two, three weeks later have to go back to, you know, Go in, go in person, and then all of a sudden things spike up and we have to go back to hybrid. I'd like to get them in face-to-face -face and keep them face-to-face. -face. 
So, you know, by, by putting that bar a little bit higher to reach, that will keep them, that should keep them in school more. You know, it's, I, I, I've read all these. I like recommendation one. Can I live with recommendation two and three? Yeah, we've got over 280 people watching YouTube right now. And I'm sure I'm gonna receive 345 nasty emails because I want kids safe. Um, and I think that, you know, my, my idea of safe is different than others. Well, I guess I can agree to dis disagree with those people. Hopefully they can agree to disagree with me. Um, but um, can I live with two th recommendation two? Yes, I can. You know, I, I just, I want to see our kids back. I've talked to teachers who say, we've got kids that are failing. We've, we've talked to teachers, they say, kids are doing great. I'm able to cover more. We're at the same spot in the curriculum we've always been. We've been, data has just been shared with us that our kids are still learning. You know, it's when they're at home, when the parents see what they're doing, to me, it's becoming a parent thing. Those parents that are complaining that their kids are sleeping in until 11 are letting their kids sleep in until 11. My kids, we get them up. They may be done earlier in the day and then they have their free time, but they're up. We're trying to maintain a, a normal school schedule when they're not in school. Um, are we always successful? No. And, uh, but, you know, the parents, whose kids are succeeding are doing a great job those kids that are those kids that aren't succeeding i don't know what to say um 90 90 some percent of them are so you know i i'll i'll shut up now but i will support recommendation two as presented and uh hopefully we're we go in and stay in and uh, not in and out thank you mr cook I appreciate you being honest and transparent about your feelings and kind of what your intentions are and your support of the metrics that you've, you know, really, I applaud you for pushing us in the beginning to go down this road. So, um, Mrs. Hood? Yeah, I just wanted to um, tag on to what Mr. Cook was saying, and I agree with him really 100%. Um, I am also hopeful, hope isn't a strategy, but I am hopeful that all the really national trends, the, the macro trends that we're seeing now of number of cases declining, number of deaths declining, really continues. And so we won't have to be looking at um, the when we come back. And, and the number two, in recommendation two, the number two, um, I, I think the... Um, when we come back, metrics are a little too high. I'm going to support recommendation two, but like in the first, in, in 2A, case counts um, over 45, that's a big leap from the low 30. So to get up to that level is really high, but, but I'm not going to suggest that we undo it at this point, but I agree completely with, with Mr. Cook, and I'm going to support um, recommendation two also. Thank you, Mrs. Hood. Um, I'll go next, and then if anybody else on the left-hand side of my screen wants to go, um, I too um, will be supporting recommendation two. I um, appreciate Mr. Cook back probably 10 weeks ago, um, pushing for some metrics and giving what I like to call a roadmap. I think it's been important dialogue that we've had as a board and with the administration um, over the last three and a half months. Um, I was taking a little more of an aggressive approach than Mr. Cook, um, but I have the utmost respect for Dr. Matthews and for his leadership in saying that he felt that this is where we needed to be for safety. And he, and he didn't compromise that, but he also opened his mind to the board as we talked through it with him over the last couple of weeks and um, helped find some metrics that um, as we see the trends go down and we're using data and science and not an arbitrary date, 
because I too will not support an arbitrary date. Um, we could have done that thousands of times throughout the last 11 months and it would have come back to bite us as Mr. Cook had said. So a date is just a date on a calendar. I'm really excited to see what happens on March 1st because that sounds like quite a date that's gonna happen. Something miraculous is gonna happen on that day. But um, using our metrics, I think that we, um, we have a roadmap, we can watch trends. I mean, if you look at the data right now, you can see that it's trending downward at a, at a fairly rapid pace. I'm imagining that there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and then we also have a safety net. And although it may be a little higher than some would like, and as Mrs. Hood pointed out, it is a safety net that if we get into a position that we got into in late October and early November, where we knew that the community spread was seeping into the schools, whether there's community spread in the schools or not, at that level of spread, it doesn't matter whether it's in your school, it's in your community and it's going to cause disruption and cause people to either get ill or need to quarantine at a much more rapid rate. So um, I will be supporting recommendation too. Mr. Smith, I know that you had your hand up before me, so I'll let you go next, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ruskin. I just had a clarifying question uh, mm -hmm. to Dr. Matthews. So if I understand everything correctly, uh, the K through six kids would have just had their first week where they would have cleared all three hurdles, which means if things continue, two more weeks would need to pass. What I can't find or I don't remember, I apologize, is then at what point do they return to school? Do we get test results on a Friday and then that next Monday they go back to school? Like what's what's that window? So here's here's what I would uh, propose tonight. Um, it uh, you know I, I will uh, verify, but in in my uh, e examination of the numbers today, it looks like this week we will hit hit all three markers. So this would be week one. Right. Uh, the the eleventh twelfth would be week two. The the um, uh, 18th, uh, 19th um, uh, would be uh, week uh, three. And so I would say that that, uh, the, that as I look at the calendar, uh, you know, if, if the trends continue where they're going, we would look to, to February 22nd uh, as the potential date of return for our K-6 students. Uh, we've uh, had, um, multiple conversations with our administrative staff already, you know, and we're, uh, we, we've looked at all of the hybrid class sizes, K to six, uh, you know, uh, what parents need to understand is, is what I mentioned in the report is that, you know, classrooms are going to be different than they are right now in the sense that um, desks will be in classrooms, students will be facing forward, there'll be uh, limited movement, um, um, all those things that that uh, are in recommendations from the CDC and, and the state of Michigan, um, and and that we will um, look to bring kids back on that February 22nd if the trends continue. Uh, we would also look to if there are class sizes that are too large. We're going to look to see what options we have. Um, you know, we have uh, this year because of the nature of the year. Uh, you know, some some um, class sizes at the K-6 level are, are larger than the typical class sizes that we have had at those levels before, as we've had to uh, divide students into both hybrid and virtual formats. And so, uh, you know, a hybrid class that has, um, you know, 26 in it, for example, uh, on, a, on, a, on an A day, they only have 13. The B day, they only have 13 as well. And so the teachers were able to work that. But now coming back together, they'll have 26. And so we're going to look at, is, are there ways to, um, you know, uh, spread those kids out in, in those buildings that have movable walls, for example? Can we use the movable walls, open them up so we can spread kids out? Are, are there ways that we might be able to bring in uh, some uh, substitute teachers for the rest of the year that would support teachers and be able to divide some classes so that, so that in some buildings where we have common space that we would be able to take a group of students out to that common space and, and work with those students uh, in smaller groups with teachers. And, you know, we've looked, we've talked with our food service 
department already. We've talked to transportation already. We've talked about all of the issues related to maintenance and making sure our classrooms are clean and, and the heart services are gonna continue to be uh, uh, cleaned throughout the day. Um, so, so we've been looking at all of these possibilities. But as I look at it, uh, you know, if, if the trend continues, we would be looking at that uh, February 22nd, that Monday, as the day that our K-6 students would return uh, to uh, five-day in-person instruction. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I also just wanted to take a quick minute and uh, compliment uh, you, Dr. Matthews and Dr. Weber and the teachers on what looked like excellent results uh, with regards to our kids reading. Um, and I hope that uh, as more data gets released and the mathematics data and, and some of the other stuff that we use to measure uh, how our kids are doing, uh, if it continues to be positive, that would be awesome. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, uh, it's awesome. And then um, I, I just, I also wanna compliment uh, my peers on the board. Uh, I think recommendation uh, one and two are, are awesome in that we have defined clear metrics uh, that are you know, shared with the public. I don't think that anyone could accuse you of moving the goalpost once we you know, approve or put something like this in place because we've established very clear metrics and I, I thank Mr. Cook for that as well. Um, as you guys all know, uh, I won't be supporting either recommendation tonight because I think the kids should have been back already. But um, I think it's great that we at least have something in, in place now. So thank you all. I think it's important to reiterate as well what Dr. Matthews had said, you know, whatever the will of the board is, um, <clears throat> I'm more than confident in our team across the district uh, to enact it. And, uh, the, one of the pieces that uh, this re very intriguing to me, uh, and no one's been able to give me an answer yet, and I don't expect any of you to, but the motivation behind why we wouldn't want to be back doing what we do all the time and what we've committed our lives to. Uh, some community members have made accusations that it's because we don't want to do the work. Uh, I don't get it. The people I serve beside throw down every day, and I'm super proud of them. So uh, whatever it is, as Dr. Matthew said, he has led these meetings and talked to us. I'm proud to say that in working with our principals, their attitude is very much whatever we need to do, we will do. So uh, Steve, thank you for leading us in that way through that and getting there. And, uh, and I appreciate you saying those things there on that as well. So thanks. Thank you, Dr. Weber. And thank you, Mr. Smith, for your questions and your um, transparency. This is Roni. Um, RJ, I, I just had a question. Um, you, you talked about um, uh, all, all the teachers are in the building every day, even if they're doing virtual, correct? Depends on the, the disposition. Uh, Dr. Kinzer may be able to answer that. Depends on uh, their own health concerns and issues. Uh, some teachers have had to be quarantined at home uh, and have taught through it while they can, which is pretty amazing. Um, but Dr. Kinzer may be uh, a better person to ask that question, Ms. Roney, thank you. So in response to uh, orders issued by MIOSHA uh, just before, well, Thanksgiving time, um, we needed to adhere to those orders. And basically it was that we all should be working remotely unless it's not feasible to do so. So the directive to our teachers was that they should be working remotely unless it's not feasible to do that. Clearly for our hybrid instructional model, it's not feasible for those teachers to work remotely. But for teachers who are delivering virtual instruction, it most likely is. There is a mechanism in place for our teachers who for whatever reason, they need to come into their classrooms to teach. That can be done. Um, we, we can provide them with clearance to do so, but they need to request it. Otherwise, the expectation is that virtual instruction is happening um, remotely. Okay. Uh, I just had a question. I, I thought they were coming in, you know, every day, um, you know, but, but, you know, our hybrids, of course, are working in the schools. Um, and, and I appreciate everything you guys have gone, done. I think... Um, 
recommendation too is wonderful. And it gives all the parents um, out there a, a goal to work t towards to be safe for the next two weeks so their kids can go back to school five days a week. So, you know, those Super Bowl parties gonna have to be only six people. Thank you, Mrs. Roney. Um, and Mr. Mena was first, Mrs. Murphy, and then it'll be your opportunity. Um, yeah, just have a, a few questions and a couple comments. Um, Dr. Matthews, I, you know, I've been tracking these numbers pretty closely like you have, and I know some community members have, um, and I think a lot of these numbers reset or come out on Thursday. So again, as, as Mr. Smith had asked earlier, my, my guess is that we would kind of take the snapshot on the Thursday, right? Because some of these, um, these three metrics are, two of the metrics are 14 day uh, metrics that roll every seven days. So we would look kind of on Thursdays and, uh, and, and that would be our metric for, for that week, assuming that Oakland County keeps up with, with, the, um, with their numbers. Um, the, my, my question is, is um, can we, some of these metrics are not kept in perpetuity on the website, it, they have to be copied down and saved. So um, I'm wondering if we can save a spot on the metric website where you're posting the daily numbers so folks can see how we're trending. And I think the community members will know from day to day whether or not we're actually gonna meet that goal uh, in, in three weeks. So uh, if I could ask you to do that, I think that, that would be great. I think, I think that everybody would appreciate that. Um, I, I did also wanna take this time to, to thank uh, Mr. Cook. I know, and I know a lot of folks out there, and as he said, probably aren't happy with some of the comments he, he, he had, but I will tell you that it's his leadership that got us to this point where, where we're actually talking about metrics. He pushed it hard early, he pushed it hard often, and um, you know, some could say, well, some, some schools are going back uh, without metrics, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe that's, that's the case. Maybe that's not the case. I, I don't know. I like to think that we're leaders in this area. I would suspect now that news will get out that this is the path that Novi went down and they will, uh, uh, they may consider this uh, best practice and, and use what we've come up with as a great solution to move forward uh, as well. Uh, and I, you know, I don't usually do this, and, and this comment is more to you, uh, Mr. Smith. I, I've been on an island with you since day one. I want the kids in school as much as you have. I, I really do. Nothing that we've done so far has gotten us this close. So I really... Mr. Manny, you're on mute. I, I really <laughs> hope that, uh, that you'll reconsider um, because... Um, uh, like I said, voting voting against this isn't going to help kids get into school any quicker. Um, am I crazy about this? No. Is it the best we've had in front of us to get the kids in class soon? I, I really think it does. I just believe in any, I, I won't say it. I, I appreciate your comment, Willie. I'll keep the other, other comments to myself. Thanks to both of you. Mrs. Murphy? Okay. First of all, I, I do really like, I'll give Paul, Paul, you're getting kudos from everybody. Thanks for pushing us in this direction. It has been um, good. I know Dr. Matthews, you've been kind of providing some different metrics out there. I know Paul really pushed to kind of hone those in um, uh, really tight and um, to make them much more usable um, for us specifically, um, which is certainly helpful because we don't want to use metrics that really aren't suitable. Obviously the conversations too that you had with Oakland County, I still recall um, the conversation you had with the one epidemiologist that talked about the 40 um, case count being the, 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 the spread threshold. And so I like that we're, we're kind of being consistent with some of that expertise that we got at that point as well. So, um, you know, I think all along we've all said, you know, we really do want our kids to be back in school. That's really important to us. I think that this demonstrates that it really is important to us, but so is safety. 
Um, it does concern me that we can't keep uh, the, the, the distancing. I know that that is going to prove challenging for teachers. I am um, praying that many of them get in. I know Suburban Showcase is having another one of their things this week and I actually got my appointment um, because I am actually seeing clients, um, younger clients that you can't see virtually to do play therapy with. So, um, so managed to get that after, you know, being on several different lists, different places. So I really am hoping that our teachers um, have that same opportunity and can get in to, to get that taken care of and that they will make teachers a big priority because I, I think that that will help uh, anxiety levels and um, give some additional safety to our teachers, which I think we all agree is really important. We can't do this without them. And they have been fabulous. Um, anybody that uh, says or thinks otherwise has not seen the work that they've been doing um, and truly um, you know, pushing through things and trying to reach out to kids and making those connections that they, that they have tried so hard to do in an age where uh, you know, it's just not, it's not easy. Um, so lots of new strategies, lots of creativity on the part of our teachers. I give them tons of credit. Um, I am concerned about the classroom sizes. I am really, um, I'm really hoping that our, uh, I guess I'm, I, I should say I'm confident. I'm consciously optimistic that our, this creative team that we have um, that has been so creative all year will continue to be creative about how we space those kids that are in those overages classes. Um, I think that's really important. We do not want 26 um, kids in a classroom that, um, you know, with, with a teacher that, you know, potentially hasn't been vaccinated. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really cautiously optimistic that we'll, we'll figure that out, that we will use the spaces in our buildings um, maybe a little bit differently, at least in the interim, um, you know, with the hope, uh, and I am, I'm, have Pollyanna-ish glasses sometimes, I suppose, but with the hope that as this dissipates and dies down and we get things better under control with vaccines and so forth, that, um, that we'll be able to come back to school next year in a very different place. Um, so I will be supporting the recommendation. I, am, uh, I was really glad to see so much hard work that went into this. So thank you, gentlemen, that for all the hard work that you did on this and um, my fellow peers, ladies too, Dr. Rustin, I know you were um, probably heavily involved in discussions. Um, so I really appreciate you pushing forth with that. So thank you, I will be supporting it. Thank you, Mrs. Murphy. Mr. Cook? Yeah, I was kind of waiting to make sure everybody got their voice before mm -hmm. I spoke anymore. Uh, sometimes I can be a little long-winded. Um, you know, I, I do want to say that these three numbers are available on the Oakland County Health Department website. Every, anybody can go find them. It's not numbers we're making up. It's it, they're published numbers. And uh, Dr. Matthews is just going to copy those and put them on. If he has a fat finger error one day, don't crucify him. Okay. Um, and then the other thing, Dr. Matthews, looking through the, this week's data, yes, we did hit it for this week for K-6. So start the planning. Um, you've got three weeks. Uh, we, we have started the planning already. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cook. Any other comments? Okay. Seeing none, Mr. Mena, I believe that we are ready for a roll call vote on recommendation two before we move on in the um, agenda item. Trustee Cook. Yes. Trustee Hood. Yeah. Trustee Mena. Yes. Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Roney. Yes. Trustee Ruskin. Yes. And Trustee Smith. No. Motion carries six to one. All righty, so we will move on to um, recommenda recommendation three. Um, recommendation three, um, I think because we've talked a while, just for some clarity, who, if someone would like to move the recommendation, I would actually ask you to read it. Mr. 
Mrs. Murphy? No. I, I'll, I'll no, I, I thought you were ready because you had. Uh, <laughs> I unmuted. I got yes. Yeah, you unmuted. Okay. I can. I can do that. No, but I, I'm not pushing you to do anything if you're not comfortable with that. Please. That's okay. No. That's good. I, okay, I will recommend that the Novi Community School District Board of Education approve returning 7 through 12 hybrid students to a five-day week in-person learning for COVID-19 case counts meet these thresholds. A, case counts for 10,000 residents in the Novi Community School District as reported on the Oakland County Health Division COVID website were at or below 20 for three consecutive weeks. B, case count averages of the three Novi zip codes, 48374, 48375, and 48377 is at or below 40 for three consecutive weeks as calculated by tracking daily numbers given at the Oakland County Health Division website. C, 14-day average case counts in Oakland County are at or below 125 for three consecutive weeks as reported on the Oakland County Health Division weekly COVID-19 report for three consecutive weeks. And two, that seven through 12 hybrid students would stay in five-day week school unless numbers begin to trend in the wrong direction. A, case counts for 10,000 residents in the Nova Community School District were at or above 40 for three consecutive weeks. B, case count averages of the case count average of the three Nova zip codes, 48374, 48375, and 48377 is at or above 60 for three consecutive weeks. And C, case counts in Oakland County are above 225 for three consecutive weeks. Thank you, Mrs. Murphy. Do we have support? Support. Recommended by Mrs. Murphy and supported by Mr. Mena. And we will open it up for questions and discussion. Ms. Dr. Matthews, did you wanna? Uh, I'd, I'd just like to remind the board that uh, uh, these numbers are lower than the K-6 and, and the primary reason is because of the, um, the increased uh, exposure that both students and staff will have to other students and staff. And so over a six period day, students will be moving classrooms six times. They'll be in the hallway six times. They'll, they'll be with six different groups of students. Uh, teachers will be seeing six different groups of students over the course of the day as well. And so I think it's important to recognize that, that because of that increased exposure, that's the rationale for having these lower numbers. And that's all I wanted to remind the board of, Dr. Ruskin. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Uh, Mr. Mena, I'll let you go first and then we'll call on Mrs. Romy. Uh, Dr. Matthews, um, again, th thanks for this. Um, when, I, when I look at these numbers that you set for high school and I understand uh, the reasoning behind setting a higher bar for seven to 12, makes total sense to me. Um, and, but when I look at the district uh, metric that you're recommending and the zip code metric you're recommending, uh, to me, it looks like you raised the bar an additional 30% above K-7. It's, it's approximately uh, what it is. I could tell that then you just kind of rounded it to, to a nice number that we can work with. It's fair, commonly done. Um, my question, though, is that the bar with regards to the county number was raised significantly higher than those 30%. Um, if, if you were to raise the bar on that one, similar to the way you raised it for the district and the zip code, the number would have came in more like 140 instead of 125. Um, and, and the reason I, I thought it was worth talking about is because if, if anything, that's the one metric that we have the least concern about. Uh, it's possible that you could have something going on way up in, in, in the North End of of the county um, that that totally has nothing to do with the district. So can you speak to that and whether or not maybe that was an oversight or or something that you would you would consider uh, moving to instead on your recommendation? Uh, I can speak to that and. Uh, the, the, you know, the rationale was trying to, to identify those numbers in a consistent way. Uh, as you point out, that was probably an oversight on my part. Uh, and, and if you wanted to uh, uh, amend the recommendation to put that at 140, uh, you know, I would be willing to, to accept that because that, that would be in line with uh, how the other numbers were calculated. Does that mean I have to read it again? No. No, no. just as amended. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Mana, please. Um, so, so with your permission, Trustee Ruskin, uh, can I go ahead and make an amended motion? 
You absolutely can. Um, so, so I would like to motion that uh, we amend uh, the current motion to modify the Oakland County case count number from 125 to 140 to make it more consistent with the other two values that we have for this particular set of metrics. Okay, do we have a support? I'll support. So um, Mr. Mena has made a um, amendment motion. Mrs. Roney has made a second. So now the discussion is only specific to the actual amendment. Um, and after, if we take a vote on that, that will be the new motion on the floor. If that was to fail, we would go back to the original motion just so that people understand since this doesn't happen often. Any questions? Um, regarding the amendment. No, okay. So we will take a vote, Mr. Mena, on your amendment. Um, and what we're doing is we're not um, voting to approve recommendation three at this point. We're just voting that people are um, comfortable with the amendment and then the motion is on the amended resolution. So please, if you can do a roll call vote for us. Trustee Cook? Yes. Trustee Hood? Yes. Trustee Mena? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Roney? Yes. Trustee Ruskin? Yes. Trustee Smith? Yes. The okay. amendment has seven to zero. I'm sorry to laugh in such a serious situation, but Mr. Smith, you do make us smile at times. Yes, he um, does. <laughs> so recommendation three as amended is now um, the amended motion on the floor that we can open it up for discussion. Mrs. Roney, please. Um, I just had a comment. You had talked about another district and I'm not sure what district it was that they did um, the high school um, they did like the three block um, where they did, you know, on Monday um, periods one, two, three, Tuesday, four, five, six. Um, is there any way we could do something like that that would alleviate some of the, you know, going through the hallways because you're only going to do it, you know, three periods? Um, kids moving around, such like that, that could maybe make our high school and the seventh and eighth grade a little safer? Uh, we'll certainly explore that with our middle and high school teams. Uh, I, I did have a conversation with a high school teacher today. Uh, you know, that makes that period, um, you know, instead of a 55 minute period, it makes it almost twice as long as that. And so the question becomes, would that be a wise use of that time? And, and would it, would educationally, it make more sense to, to continue to have the teachers teach in a, what, what would be considered their normal schedule, as opposed to trying to recreate again, uh, uh, the teaching uh, approach and teaching methodology uh, uh, to a new format. And, and so, you know, right now they, they have their kind of lessons aligned to, to um, uh, that, that 55 minute period. Uh, and, and so if we ask them now you're going to have a 110 minute period, it's more than just putting two lessons together. It, you know, it, it uh, the, the, the kind of the, the approach that they take really is, is not just, oh, I'll just combine Monday and Tuesday's lesson together. It, 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 it would be more than that. And so we'll have that conversation. And certainly if we think that that would be effective, we would, we would look to do that. Uh, but, but we'll let the, the teachers and the administrators in those buildings weigh in before we would make that decision. I don't know if Dr. Weber has any insight on that or not. Our piece on it really is whatever transition that we have coming back and, and however we do that, we'll do what we've always done here, which has led us, um, you know, in the past decade at least to really, I think, a, a positive trend, which is listening to our teachers, having them help guide us in that and in, in to make these pieces happen. Um, we're obviously, we still have a, a ways to go this year. And when we do fully return and come back and that day comes, we're going to be have to be incredibly intentional 
uh, to check in our, in our kids and our parents and to help them. So I would say to that question, uh, I have an amazing amount of faith in our teachers to help us find that answer. And as soon as we need to, we're going to get after it. Thank you. Yeah, so, we, this is Roni. Go ahead. Well, just to follow up, we used to do that block schedule. And um, I, I don't know if you guys were here. I mean, it was very successful. I, I know, Bobby, you were a part of it. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, of course, I've always wanted to go back to block, but there's, you know, that little dollar sign, that, you know. Roni, that's the piece, right? Like, as we've said before, you know, we can do virtually anything you want us to do. It's just, I know. It's the opportunity cost, like for anything, right? Yeah. Uh, Mr. McIntyre, I just saw a movie. He's kind of he's gonna come at me. I just saw him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking, Greg. I see that smile on his face. You know. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mrs. Roney. Uh, any comments or questions? Um, we'll start with Mr. Mena, and then I'll move to Mr. Cook next. Oh, you're muted, Mr. Mena. I want to say, did did uh, he have an opportunity to speak on this one? I didn't want to jump in front of him, but uh, will if you want me to. He seems okay. You okay there, Mr. Cook? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, the the and and the, the other comment I wanted to make on on this um, on this particular recommendation, as well as the one previous. There, there are a lot of extraneous things that could happen between now and, and the end of the school year. And what I would prefer seeing on top of these metrics is um, giving Dr. Matthews the ability to send kids to school earlier before the metrics are met, if indeed something happens that that deems that you know things are are safe for kids to go into class so so um you know whatever that is and maybe everybody gets their um, um their shots their vaccines beforehand for example is one thing that i can think of um giving him the ability to do that and as well um if the kids are in class and then the metrics start going up and start hovering at or about um, the go back to hybrid numbers that we voted on also, also giving him the option of keeping kids in class at his discretion if he still feels it's safe at that time. So it's something that, that maybe we can discuss, probably would fit better in four, but that would mean if folks are amenable to, to it, that I would probably have to read the motion to add text for those two as well, a, a number five and a uh, four and a five. So I do think that that's probably better in number four. Um, but if you feel like you need some further information or clarity on kind of whether it be Dr. Matthews feeling or other trustees feelings on it in order to, you know, have some clear guidance moving through recommendation three, I could certainly ask them to speak to it. Would you, do you want them to speak to it right now? Is I that think I think, yeah, I think it would be great to hear Dr. Matthews' opinion on that one. Okay, Dr. Matthews. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the, the idea of, of the flexibility. Uh, you know, we kind of exercised that in the fall because uh, we had uh, identified uh, kind of a threshold uh, back in September. And clearly when uh, COVID kind of ramped up there through November and December, we kept our students in school, even though, uh, you know, the numbers were significantly higher. Uh, and, and we were able to do that, I believe, because we had uh, uh, safe conditions and socially distanced and all those kinds of things. And, and so, you, you know, the, it might be appropriate for the board to, to, to kind of formalize that flexibility. Um, it, it may be that uh, between now and our next meeting, which is uh, in two weeks on the 18th, when, as a board, you get the fortunate opportunity to uh, vote once again on the uh, uh, reconfirmation of the return to school plan that, that we could include it in, in, in that uh, discussion uh, because as you know, legislation requires us to vote on this uh, every month. And, and based on the discussion that's happening tonight, we would fold in um, what the decision is tonight and we might be able to fold in those kind of comments in that discussion on February 18th. 
because this is kind of a new concept, perhaps uh, it would it would be appropriate for us to have a little bit more discussion of that before we tr we try to formalize that tonight. I think that I think that would be appropriate then to just go ahead and and consider or having a discussion about adding that text in the actual monthly COVID um, discussion and vote that we have. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mena, for bringing that up and Dr. Matthews for asking for some more time to look into that. I, I encourage you to kind of look into, you know, some of the legislation requires that the board um, weigh in and make the final decision. And I also don't want to put all that, um, I don't want to say pressure, you're the leader of, you know, the school district, but also, um, you know, maybe a suggestion on if you feel that it's deemed necessary that you would, we would encourage you to come to the board sooner with a special meeting or something and not just wait till the next meeting, which I think um, is Mr. Mena's idea is to really kind of have some flexibility when we find opportunities for our kiddos and their um, instructional needs. Mrs. Roney, did you have, you were good? Okay, Mr. Cook, you're next. I know you're waiting really patiently there. <laughs> Yeah, that's one thing I have is patience, right? Um, you know, uh, the only thing uh, I'm not crazy about this one, and I wasn't crazy about the last one, is the three weeks on if we're going to go back to hybrid. Um, like many others, uh, like Mr. Mena has said, uh, I kind of track this data, and you'll notice that every time it uh, gets worse, it gets worse very quickly. And the three-week time frame is, is, you know, could be detrimental in this point and then really blow things out of the water. Um, that being said, though, um, I don't have a problem, you know, trusting Dr. Matthews. And if we do what Mr. Mena said and give him the leeway to, you know, call a special board meeting to say, hey, things are going haywire faster than we expected. And, you know, we really need to do something now. I trust Dr. Matthews would come to the board and uh, the board would listen to him. Um, the other thing is, you know, having seen the data for this week and everything uh, and the trend and the direction it is heading, um, Dr. Matthews, you have four weeks to get the high school kids back in. That is correct. Because if the, the way it's heading next week, you will hit all three of these targets. Right. That's what it looks like. So, so everybody stay safe and uh, he's got four weeks to get kid, the high school kids back too. Thanks, Mr. Cook, and I love your optimism because if we do continue to trend in this positive direction, it just means things are getting better around us in our community, and there's there's some great changes. So, uh, Mr. Smith, please. Again, just a point of clarification: uh, if we move forward, and it sounds like uh, Dr. Matthews recommended that we would vote on it at our next meeting, not tonight, about allowing him some discretion. I just because that's something that I think I, I, I definitely would support giving <laughs> what well, don't um, it's a, it's a compliment. I, I, I want to support that because uh, that, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm not loving the recommendations is the consecutiveness and the non consistency and, and you know the, the way it's starting to look is by the end of February or by March 1st we will be in school K through 12, which of course, I love that idea. I'm just trying to be consistent. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there to make sure it was a separate issue. But if it was a separate issue, I would definitely support that, Steve. So for some clarity, Mr. Smith, I believe um, the consensus was um, that there will be further discussion about this piece um, at our next meeting and potentially a recommendation brought forward for discussion. Any further questions, comments? No? Okay. Seeing none, all is quiet. Mr. Mena, we will take a roll call vote, please, on recommendation three. Trustee Cook? Yes. Trustee Hood? Yes. Trustee Mena? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Roney? Yes. Trustee Ruskin? Yes. Trustee Smith? Nope. Recommendation passes six to one.
We will now move on to recommendation um, number four of this action item. If um, someone would like to move the recommendation, Mrs. Murphy. I'll, I'll move it. I move that the, Nova, that the Board of Education direct the superintendent to communicate weekly the status of some meeting thresholds to the parent and school community. Two, that the Board of Education and administrative team work collaboratively with teachers and support staff to ensure that plans are in place to begin five-day in-person instruction for hybrid students when the thresholds are met. And three, that virtual students remain virtual as per their choice in December. Support. Okay. Uh, recommended by Mrs. Murphy and supported by Mr. Manoff. And do we have any questions or discussion? Mr. Cook? Yeah, er, um, earlier, Mr. Mena had asked Dr. Matthews to put this on the web page. And uh, I know some, some of the data, you know, is reported as a daily basis, but we're looking at this on a weekly basis. Um, are you going to update the web page daily or are you going to just do it on a weekly basis? On, in a uh, you know, right now, I would, I would, I'll, um, I have, I don't know, uh, is the short answer. Uh, the, the, the uh, you know I look at it daily and uh, and so uh, but oftentimes you know I'm I'm looking at that data late at night and so uh, between Miss Holly and myself we will figure out how to how to make it uh, transparent for the community so that we get that data to everybody as quickly as we can. I, I guess I would recommend that we look at the data on a same day the week okay. all the time because. I know the number comes out for the the countywide on uh, on Thursdays. Right. The the district comes out on Thursdays. It's the area code one that changes basically on a daily basis. So, right. um, and it's that area code one that disappears each day as well. <laughs> you know, the, the the day before, unless you grab it that day, you don't really get it. And so, 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 so we'll we'll figure it out, and we'll we'll I'll communicate to the board and the community exactly how we're going to do that. And then the number we the number that we're looking at has been what has been reported on a single day, the average of the three area codes, Correct. not the average of the week for each area code, then all averaged together. So I suggest we continue with that. Okay. And uh, so we're not changing. Okay. Mr. Mena, do you need some clarity? The, the uh, I, I think area code was a misnomer, right? We're talking about zip code on those? Yes. Z yes, okay, zip code. Okay, I'm good. sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Misspoke. All right. Just want to make sure. Not making fun of you, my friend. Any other comments, questions, discussion points on this? Okay. Seeing none, I think we're ready for a roll call vote, Mr. Mena. Trustee Cook? Yes. Trustee Hood? Yeah. Trustee Mena, yes. Trustee Murphy, yes. Trustee Roney, yes. Trustee Ruskin, yes. And Trustee Smith, yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you very much. And again, I would really like to reiterate um, the board's work on this and um, the administration's work. Dr. Matthews, this isn't, you know, I've told you before, it's not a boxing match on who wins. We're all here for the same reason. And we know that um, your initial recommendation was what your belief is. And I applaud you for hearing through with that and also listening to feedback that you're receiving and providing other opportunities um, to move in this direction. So thank you very much. Uh, next, we will move on to information and discussion. We only have two items tonight. The first one is 2021 um, MASB Board of Direct Directors election. Dr. Matthews. Thank you, Dr. Ruskin. This really is a, a Board of Education issue. Uh, as, as members of the Michigan Association of School Boards, um, the Novi Community School District Board of Education has the right to cast a ballot for a group director in MASB Board of Directors election. Regions are based on geography. Nobody, Novi will be casting one vote in region eight and one vote in group five, districts with pupil enrollment between 5,000 and 11,000. So in region eight, there are four candidates running for one seat and they're listed there. We also provide you with the information on each of those candidates as well. 
and uh, the Novi Community Schools Board of Education is asked uh, to discuss tonight for whom they would like to cast their vote. And then, uh, and if you don't have the answer tonight, that that's fine. Uh, it really, the vote will really be at our regular meeting on February 18th. Uh, vote takes place online. Uh, the district receives one ballot, which has been emailed to the superintendent's secretary. And after a decision is made, the secretary will cast the ballot for the board. Uh, we bring this tonight because the deadline is Wednesday, March 1st. And so you have the information there listed. We would encourage you to read it over. We would encourage you to, um, uh, at the February 18th uh, meeting, uh, come to consensus on who, who you would like to nominate. Typically, we ask if any of the board members know any of these people, and if you do, to, to share with the rest of the board. Uh, but certainly tonight, uh, you don't have to make a decision. You can just look over this information in the next two weeks and come February 18th, we can make that decision for the board. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. So before we move on, if you have any questions or comments, but if not, we'll have everybody take their time to read through this and um, have further discussion about this at the next meeting. Okay. Mrs. Murphy, you were unmuting yourself, so. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, I think typically we make sure we vote for somebody in our county. I think there's only one person that's not in our county. It's in there just because that seems to be a better representation. I mean, certainly we can ask who, who if anybody knows any of them. I, I know that Bergett must sit on the same committee that you, Danielle and Marianne do. So maybe you have some contact with her from that that you'd like to share, but um, yeah. But we'll have to vote on at the next meeting. Right. Correct. Yeah, so just sit on the committee. Um, certainly, I think that I would like to take a little bit of time. Um, I know that Ferndale Public Schools does some really amazing, innovative work um, in uh, uh, the equity and diversity issue. And so I really personally, um, although she's Birgit sits on our committee and she's currently on the board, I, I what they could have put forward before I make any recommendations. You're on mute, sorry. Um, I think Bobby said, okay, that's great. <laughs> um, Mrs. Roney? I was just gonna say, Mary also sits on our com um, committee as well. Um, so there's, there's two, but no, I think it's great that everybody reads them over. They have some good points and um, I, I've also, um, Gina Walker has been on the one where the uh, where you can go in and they talk about what all, uh, all the different schools are doing. So all four of these people are very active. Thank you. Mrs. Hood? Yeah, I was gonna say um, on the Oakland Schools Government Relations Committee meeting last night, um, three of the ladies came in and or joined our, didn't come in, joined our um, Zoom call. So Sandra from Ferndale was not able to. Um, Mary, I know from Oxford, um, I know she is on the Government Relations Committee meeting and I know her from work on that committee. Um, she's been on only in on a board, her board of education for two years. Um, I think everyone knows Birgit well, but I have to say, and, and Bobby, I didn't know it was a, I don't want to say a rule, but you know, kind of a, a, an agreement that we voted for, or we typically support Oakland County residents, but Gina Walker um, from New Haven schools um, was, really a, a compelling guest. The things that, since she's been on that board for 10 years, and actually she beat her father-in-law for the third seat. When they ran against each other, there were three seats, four candidates, and her father-in-law was the fourth candidate who didn't make it on. So she beat her father-in-law, who apparently had been on the board for a long time. Anyway, um, she was, the, the, the turnaround and the improvements that have happened in New Haven schools. Um, and I would say it, while she was on the board, and I was gonna say under her watch, but while she was on the board are, are very impressive. So, uh, however, um, I will, I respect that um, we'll choose someone from Oakland County, but um, I'm sorry, if, if that was the case. There's no 
a rule about that. I know. I know. You didn't say that. I said just, you know, generally. And that's fine. And that's fine. Um, so everyone can read and we can talk about it next week. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you for the feedback from both of you. All righty. Next, we will move on to information and discussion. Um, the 2021 copier equipment purchase. Dr. Matthews. I know that this is the agenda item that all of you have been waiting for. Uh, with, with the continued support of the Novi community, the district passed a bond in 2019 that will support facility and technology projects. Part of the plan for the bond projects was the refresh of district copiers. The district currently has 53 copiers with an average age of seven years old. Part one of the refresh plan will be to replace 36, 35 black white copiers and one color copier of the oldest and least reliable devices. In addition, the project will include the installation of paper cut. Uh, the, th that sounds painful actually, but I'm, I'm sure it's a good thing. Uh, the district received proposals from two vendors based on state cooperative purchasing con contracts, applied imaging and RICO. Each vendor has established contracts with school districts in the Tri-County area. Both vendors reviewed the district's existing fleet, inventory, copy volumes, and of serviceability to determine the recommendations. Anthony Lercurio, Senior Technology Coordinator, and Jeff Maz, Technology Director, reviewed each company's proposal. The proposed equipment, copy volume, and installation plans were aligned as part of the review process. Each vendor included device rebates after installation. The replaced equipment will be disposed with an independent recycler. The administration is recommending the Board of Education approve the purchase of 36 copiers, installation services, training, and support from applied imaging in the total amount of $481,708.84. Pricing is uh, based on the Michigan Intergovernmental Trade Network Cooperative. The district is recommending the applied imaging solution based on the Canon equipment design, the reputation of applied imaging, and the savings uh, on support and maintenance over the RICO proposal. The estimated savings on the cost per copy is approximately $40,507 over 60 months. The purchase of the copier equipment is presented and recommended to the Board of Education uh, tonight with the awarding of the bid at the next regular meeting on February 18th. And uh, tonight we have uh, Jeff Moz. He's hung in there. Thank you, Moz. And we also have Mr. McIntyre. Either one would be able to address any concerns or questions that the board might have on this issue. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Mr. Menno? <laughs> yeah, I actually do have some questions uh, here for either of you gentlemen. Um, I'll just... Uh, well, I'll just ask here. The first one is, do you know? I looked at this, and and, and even though it, it probably hurts Dr. Matthews to talk about paper cut, um, do do we do we have a significant problem with the waste paper waste um, that would require the addition of that particular functionality on on the uh, print on the copiers? So, um, if I may, Mr. McIntyre. Um, so, I think Mr. Mena, every district has paper waste, unintentional just by the nature of school systems and the way printing happens. And what we've done over the last several years um, is work on device um, reduction and trying to move our printing to our copiers. By the nature of a copier and the way it's worked in the past, teachers would send, staff would send print jobs. Um, they may forget to pick them up. They may um, leave them there at the copier. You may have a typo, you have to resend. What paper cut does is it basically secures the printing and allows um, the, the user to go release the print job. So say I was typing this memo um, and I found a typo after I already sent it and it happened to be something that I was printing 100 copies. In the old model, it would print out automatically. In the new model, I don't have to release that print job. Therefore, or saving uh, you know 100 sheets of paper plus 100 clicks. Uh, so when you look at it, paper cut, what we've seen is about a 10% reduction. And we're currently budgeting about 17 million copies. I used a million dollars on a conservative estimate. So it, it's one of those easy green savings and also low fruit that we start to see uh, a savings in not only paper, but also, you know, wasted materials and additional expenses. So if, if I can continue, the, 
Um, so it's kind of cool from, from what you're saying is somebody prints something to this printer. It doesn't print until they literally go to the machine, stick their card in, and then it, and then it prints. And if somebody's sitting at using that printer, they could literally go to another one that's connected on the network, stick their card in, and it'll release that there. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I suspect at times you'll have some pretty large print jobs. So if, if somebody release, sends the print job, right, and with the expectation of being able to sit at their desk for a while um, and then go pick it up, is, is there a way to release it early so they don't have to sit in front of the printer uh, waiting for it? Yeah, not at this time that I'm aware of. There's no way to circumvent the release. And that's a little bit by nature of what we find is, um, you know, those release jobs often get left unattended. Um, you know, you run out of paper, it causes more delays. So, you know, if you're running a big job, you'll go through the 500 sheets and then somebody's waiting to, you know, print their job and somebody's got to go refill it. Um, let that job finish again. So what should have been, you know, a five or six minute job becomes a 10 or 12 minute job becomes because someone's not there and causes additional wait time for the end user. So it's really a kind of a change in mindset. And what we find is people start to shift the way they print. Um, you know, you may print the job at, you know, send the print job at night, pick it up in the morning. You know, you might be an early bird and it's sitting there in the queue. You hit it after you go to the mailbox, pick up your mail, release the print job. And, you know, before you head back to class, you know, you, you grab your print job. So it's a shifting of mindset a little bit. Um, there is always a little bit of that, you know, initial angst about, you know, I'm not going to be able to pick it up when I need it. I'm on my prep or I'm running to the bathroom and I'm trying to do a couple of quick things. But what we found is it kind of balances out because we allow so many different print options in, in a building as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mena, and thank you, Matt. Looks like Mrs. Roney has a question, and then we'll move to Mr. Cook. I, I just really don't, I don't have a question. I do have, um, I do work with Applied Imaging at our um, office building, and their service has been very well. Um, so just a little information there. Uh, we've been very happy with them. We've had them for I think 10 years now. Thank you. Mr. Cook? Yeah, um, back to the, the uh, paper cut. Is that, did I hear correctly, you can go to any device and pull it and release it at any device or does it have, are you sending it to a particular device and have to go to that device to have it released? So um, under this model right now, because we have, we'll have Canon and Rico. Um, you'll be able to pick them up at the Canon devices and then the Rico at the Rico. So um, once we get all the devices refreshed, you'll be able to pick them up at any device in a building once they're all on the same platform. There's some intercompatibility issues between the different manufacturers, but each building, I believe, has more than one Canon device in the refresh right now. So you'll have multiple locations. And then I believe next year we have some devices slated for re refresh again. Um, as we looked at it. And that was one of the pieces that when we looked at it in our uh, inventory, we needed a provider that could support both Canon and Rico. So right now it'll be, you'll be able to pick it up at any Canon device. And it's not just the building. So if I'm going from Meadows up to ESB for a meeting um, and I had you know some professional development or something I was doing, I could send my print job and actually pick it up at the administration building with my swipe card. Okay, so Mr. Dinkelman can pick it up wherever he goes because he's the one that's yep. always in various buildings from what I can tell. So Correct. Constantly. Okay, yep. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Mr. Smith? Maz, is the rebate offered by Bolt their way of giving us money back for the resale of the used ones that they're refreshing? No, those are rebates... Um, directly from uh, the two companies. In addition, we are going to uh, use a third party reseller, a refurbisher, and they've given us some preliminary numbers, but we haven't been able to get an inspection. 
So there will be some additional funds uh, we anticipate coming from the third party refurbisher recycler. Is that like, like 50 grand or something like that? Uh, it's about 30,000. Okay. Once in, you know, of course they have to inspect the machines and then they have a ballpark on what right. the value of, you know, the materials within that recycling machine are. Okay. Thanks very much. You're uh, you're a pleasure to listen to. You really know this stuff. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cook. I just thought of this, uh, Maz, I'm, I'm sorry, but um, what's this going to put the average uh, age of our devices at? Or, or copier printers? Um, well, once we get them installed, it'll bring it down drastically. I think our next series of devices are four to five years old, um, the, the remaining devices. So I don't, I haven't figured out the math on that once we put in 36 new devices. So we pretty much have done this in, in 50, 50 chunks. We're trying to do it in, in incremental chunks. And back in 2014, we had a substantial refresh um, <laughs> If you recall, with yes, I, I remember that. So that's that's kind of why I was asking. Yeah, well. that's why. So we had that kind of balloon, and then we had some onesie twosies that have kind of you know skewed it a little bit that are a little old, uh, a little newer. The other thing that you'll notice is we've also standardized some of the models in this, so it allows us the flexibility to manage the fleet across all the buildings. So if we find you know we can balance over a five-year life expectancy or a six-year life expectancy and make sure that the devices are kind of wearing out even, kind of like your tires on your car. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Any other questions? If not, you can send them through um, directly to Maz or Mr. Lucrecio um, or through Dr. Matthews and he will get the information we need moving forward to put this as an action item at our next meeting. Okay. Thank you, Miles. Thanks for sticking with us through the night, three hours in. We appreciate all your work. All righty. Next, we have our committee reports. We have just one committee report this evening. We have the Governance and Policy Committee, which met, and Mr. Cook is our um, chair for that committee. Mr. Cook? Yeah, um, we reviewed uh, three policies, or well, one in our board operating procedure and one policy kind of interrelate, which is uh, remote meetings. Um, we had enough uh, questions that we sent those back to um, Kevin Sutton uh, to have that looked at and uh, hopefully to fit more of what we currently practice. Um, they were tightening it down a bit and uh, we weren't too, too fond of that. Um, the last one was on bullying, and uh, I, th I think we had a couple minor revisions there that we were looking at, and uh, I think we'll probably t have them all come back to committee before we'll bring them to the to the board. So we we look forward to meeting again, and before we bring them at, back. So thank you, Mr. Cook. And but as quick as the meeting. Yeah, you ran a very efficient meeting, and um, we enjoyed having Mr. Smith. Uh, there with us. So appreciate both of you and your time yesterday. And Dr. Matthews uh, sat in on the meeting as well. Next, we have comments from the audience. Dr. Matthews, this is the second opportunity for comments from the audience for tonight. Um, it doesn't need to be related to agenda items. Do we have any further comments from the audience? Uh, we, uh, uh, Dr. Ruskin, we have three additional comments. Okay. Uh, are, will these be limited to two minutes each as well? Glancing at them, are they real long? I mean, I, I, I hate uh, to um, one of them is probably longer than two minutes. I am so. ready. Okay. There we go. Uh, first uh, is from Ashley Gladen. Um, hello, Board of Education and Dr. Matthews. My name is Ashley Gladen, and I'm a parent of two students at Novi Woods Elementary. I have a son in fourth grade and a son in first grade. In light of tonight's discussion, I wanted to share my thoughts and perspective. Both of my boys started the school year in the virtual modality. At the time, uh, we believed this was a consistent and safer option given the state of the pandemic. My boys are both school and self-motivated, so our family believed this might actually be a positive experience. As the year progressed, I noticed both of the boys had different virtual experiences. At the first grade level, it worked better than I expected. I believe it was as successful as it was because of the amazing, amazing teacher Mrs. Jarges is. 
and the continued effort she made to ensure students had what they needed, understood what was expected of them, and balanced the screen and paper time. She made changes early on and listened to what parents and students needed. For my fourth grader, it was a bit different. I would like to note uh, many of the, our difficulties for him were not teacher related. The teachers were actually so receptive to his struggles and offered many great solutions. He struggled with feeling comfortable speaking up in the virtual environment. He had frustrations and anxieties that we realized after many weeks were, were ones that are easier to manage and often non-existent in the physical classroom. He was a major reason for our decision to switch modalities for the second semester. Now I realize our change has only been in place for a few weeks, but the impact is amazing. The first day they were able to attend school was eye-opening. They came home rejuvenated and excited. They shared their day and their stories with me, and I had a renewed spirit, uh, uh, renewed spirit to listen. I was not naive enough to think that the switch was my cure-all. Both modalities have their positives and negatives. I know many parents who have criticized each method of learning, but from a parent who has seen both sides, I can assure you each method and every teacher is giving it their all. I respect and appreciate all NOVA is doing for both learning environments and the safety of our students and families. I wish there was an easier answer, a clear winning decision, but there isn't. Would we like, uh, would, we, would we all like our students to be back full time? Of course, all parents, students and teachers and staff would love this, but Time. the reality is that we are still in a pandemic. Uh, the next uh, is from uh, Jody Payne. Uh, does the district have sufficient guest teachers for a return to five days, especially since few teachers have been fully vaccinated? And the last comment this evening is from Katie C. I understand the frustration surrounding the situation, no matter what side of it we are on. But what I'm having trouble with is the time spent on reading comments that spend two minutes each accusing teachers and administrators of not trying or not working hard. Many of the comments are full of insults, sometimes directed at specific people. These comments are hurtful and a waste of time. Our teachers have had to reinvent the way they teach with no guideline on how to do that. Of course, it's not the same as past years, but we have never had a pandemic before, so that should be expected. I hear it time and time again, Nova is number one. Shouldn't part of being number one be that we set an example of how to treat people? Is there a way to weed out comments that are accusatory, directed at specific people, cruel, et cetera? I have personally seen too many people hurt by those comments and it doesn't help make this better. I don't mean weed out comments that question a proposal or a decision, but there are constructive ways to say those things. I think as number one, we can do better. Uh, and just as a reminder, uh, we will make sure the board uh, gets all of these comments so that you can read uh, them all fully. And those are the comments this evening, Dr. Ruskin. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. And next we have the superintendent's report. If you have any breath left in you. I have uh, one breath left and, oh. and it would be just to uh, express my uh, deep thanks and appreciation to our teachers and our administrators, our bus drivers, our secretaries, our child care workers, our early childhood staff, uh, uh, you know, the tech staff, uh, food service, custodial. Um, this has been a most unusual year. And, and what I know to be true is that each and every one of those staff members has done everything they can to make this year successful. Today, I walked by the high school uh, and there was uh, food uh, stacked on tables uh, outside of the high school cafeteria awaiting our families as they would come to pick up that food because food service has been distributing food since last March. Uh, I, I walked uh, into the high school and I saw tubs of uh, work there outside the high school that our virtual teachers and our hybrid teachers had had collected and, and uh, were placing there for our, our students to come pick it up so they could continue to do work at home. Um, our teachers and our staff have done amazing things this year, and I want them to know that I, I deeply, deeply appreciate everything that they have done, and I really believe that we have made a tremendous difference this year, and that's my report this evening, Dr. Ruskin. Thank you, Dr. Matthews, and you and they absolutely have, so. Um, next, we will move to administrative reports, and we will move to Mr. McIntyre. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ruskin. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the uh, thank the board for reviewing our copy of refresh proposal. Um, that's one of the expense reductions I've been looking at since I arrived here. So I'm really happy about the um, the efficiency and the expense reduction we can gain from moving to these new copiers. And then the second thing I want to inform the board of: last week I was informed that uh, 
Moody's, the investor service, the firm that evaluate our credit risk for our bonds, they're going to change their rating methodology. And the old way, they used to lump cities, counties, and school districts, they were combined. So they're gonna strip us out and look at us as an individual now, school districts. So currently we have an AA2 rating, which is a high grade rating with Moody's. Um, and they've identified 34 school districts that will be reviewed for a possible downgrade. I'm happy to say that we're not one of those school districts. And so it's important that we continue to monitor our fund balance, our enrollment and our debt. And so as more developments occur, I will keep you guys abreast as to what happens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Thanks for all your work each and every day. Next, we have Dr. Kinzer. Thank you, Dr. Ruskin. Uh, on Monday afternoon, uh, we held our fourth uh, of our Mentee Monday series of professional development for our new teachers. Uh, Darby Hoppenstedt uh, presented on our MTSS systems, uh, first to our 712 new teachers and then later to our K-6. And uh, Dr. Weber and I had some conversation after uh, the presentation and the, the, the conversation we had was how impressive our first year teachers are. Uh, their level of engagement, um, the, the stories they, they shared about their commitment to their students, whether it be virtual or in a hybrid modality, really impressive. I just want you to know we have a tremendous group of first year teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kinzer. Dr. Weber. Hey, I uh, just want to say uh, thank you. There's a whole bunch of people out there and also to each and every parent and student and board member. And this is hard. This is really hard. And I think uh, let's give ourselves and each other the grace that we all need to make it through this. I think there's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I'll tell you when you see people get vaccinated and hear people get vaccinated, there's a kind of hope that I don't think we've had in a long time. And that feels really good. So take care of yourselves out there. Uh, from what I'm hearing is howling like crazy outside. So uh, I don't know, Dr. Matthews. I know you have some power. Maybe you just want to make the announcement now. I will make the announcement. We are having school tomorrow. Oh, come on. Oh. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dr. Weber. I see you tried there with your... Uh with your colleague. I mean, that would have been really exciting, a board meeting announcement, but anyway. Um, next, we have an opportunity for board communication. Does anyone have anything that they would like to share? Mrs. Hood? Mrs. Hood? I did not raise my, I did not raise my hand. Oh, but, but you yes, I do. Mike, sometimes I know. I watch that. I don't wait for the wave, so. Okay. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to, um, this, I'll make it brief. It's late. So one of our community members is a mental health professional. I know we have many community members who are mental health professionals, but um, this one in particular does um, mental health moments. Um, I see her on Facebook and I listened to her today and it was about bullying. And she said, she said many things that, you know, kind of struck me and she said, don't be a bystander, be an upstander. And who, and, and to, when you notice or you witness bullying, um, you ask yourself who benefits from me being quiet. And I, I just want to, the last comment that Dr. Matthews read about the commentary. So a, a, a parent or a teacher was commenting about the commentary that we have gotten. And um, I have been um, gratified by so many people reaching out and saying, in via email, we've all gotten them to say, you're doing a great job. I appreciate everything the district and the teachers and the administration are doing for our kids. And then we have some who, you know, as a fellow adult, I, I just want to say, when you send us 15 emails, and some of you will know, I mean, that we've had multiple parents who have sent that many emails, and they're often insulting, they're often rude, they're often condescending, unprofessional, 
towards the leadership of our district, not not us. I mean, we're we're elected and we can take it or leave it, but towards the leadership of our district and our teachers. It is let let your son or daughter read it before you hit send or before you tweet, because I think middle schoolers and high schoolers will say, oh, geez, don't send that. Do not send that. That's not nice. That's cruel. Um, and, you know, bullies are behind keyboards are still bullies. And um, when you send 15 emails berating our, our superintendent to open schools on this date, and then we have, um, we are in receipt of probably an unintended communication from this same person who says that the COVID risk is, is nonsense and there is no reason to treat it differently than the flu is really you need to stop and think what you're doing before you hit enter um, or before you hit return and send that stuff. And that's all. I just wanted to speak up. Um, it's um, I would be doing, I think, and I speak for myself, obviously, I don't speak for the board, um, but I think we do our wonderful teachers and staff and parapros a disservice when we don't push back on this kind of stuff. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Hood, for sharing your feelings, feedback, and opinion. Um, do we have any other board communication? Mr. Mana? Yes, thank you. Make sure I'm off of mute. Um, so I, um, I, a couple things I want to say. I watched the library board meeting uh, last week, and uh, they brought up an issue. Um, well, first, as you know, library hasn't always been open because of, of COVID, right? And um, so Chartwells hasn't always been able to use, um, you know, the area there that they have service um, regularly. Um, so the library board and the library director took it upon themselves to waive the fee that they normally charge uh, Chartwells for this last pass section of time. And I really don't know how often the payments are made. And um, I thought it was a great thing. I thought it was a fair thing to do for Chartwells. And it tells me that they really, um, they really cherish the relationship they have with not only Chartwells, but also the school district. So I would be remiss if I if I didn't thank the um, the library board and Julie Farkas for that. Um, also, uh, you know, big just big news today. I wanted to thank everybody who worked so hard advocating for our student athletes over the past month. Um, you know, to to folks um, who were vocal and respectfully vocal, I, I should say, on social media. I, I I thank you. I thank you for for the work you did there and the folks who who reached out to their legislators. I wanna thank you for that as well. And also to all those folks from Nova who actually took the time to go out to Lansing on a cold day to have their voices heard, thank you. Uh, clearly you were heard and you did indeed make a difference. Thank you, Mr. Mena for sharing that. And any other board communication? Okay. Hearing none, I would like to just thank the board and the administration and, um, you know, kudos to everybody for all they do. And um, importantly to our students, as Mr. Mena said, there were some students who had a learning experience. They had a life lesson over the weekend. They let their voices be heard. And we really do look forward to the student athletes returning safely um, with safety protocols in place very, very soon, as soon as next week. So it's been a long night and I appreciate everybody's feedback. And if I can get a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Board. You guys are so fast. I would say the six other board members move to adjourn, Mr. Mena. But I will say Mrs. Murphy made a motion. Mrs. Hood supported it. If I can get a roll call vote, please. Trustee Cook. Yes. Trustee Hood. Yes. Trustee Mena. Yes. Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Roney. Yep. 
Trustee Ruskin. Yes. Trustee Smith. Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Have a great night, everybody.